fact, Foucault got paid with weed for this. He actually called it the Chomsky hash. Is that true? All right, this is Foucault versus Chomsky on human nature. Toen Galilei in de 17e eeuw ontdekte dat de aarde om de zon draaide in plaats van omgekeerd, was dat voor veel mensen een grote schok. Zij hadden tot dan toe de overtuiging gehad dat de mens in het centrum van de kosmos stond en zij hadden daarop ook hun gehele levensovertuiging gebouwd en nu bleek dat ineens niet het geval te zijn. De theorie van Foucault kan men verduidelijken door vast te stellen dat hij eigenlijk met betrekking tot de cultuur een soort van Galilei standpunt inneemt. Immers met name sinds de tijd van Galilei heeft men eigenlijk wat de cultuur betreft en de maatschappij gedacht dat de mens daar wel in het centrum stond. Hij heeft ze tenslotte gemaakt. En Foucault ontkent dit. Niet het subject telt in de cultuur, zegt hij, maar de structuur. Het algemene. Dog, this man is speaking gibberish. That's French eudaimonia. And it is gibberish, but we respect it here. Iets wat op zich al te begrijpen is, als men bedenkt dat de regels volgens welke men zich gedraagt, voor verreweg het grootste deel al uitgevonden waren, voordat men werd geboren. En dat de naam van de uitvinder ons volstrekt onbekend is. Nu kan men Foucault met Galilei vergelijken, maar in een ander opzicht kan men Chomsky ook met Galilei vergelijken, omdat hij... Okay. No, you, you cannot compare Chomsky to Galileo. I'm sorry. There's a limit, okay? There's a limit. I wouldn't even compare... I wouldn't compare Foucault to Galileo either. Um, no. No, 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 no. Is it Dutch? Is it Dutch? I don't know. You, all, you Europeans all sound the same to me. In de taalwetenschap, de linguistiek, zijn vak een geweldige revolutionerende werking heeft gehad over de gehele wereld. Chomsky heeft in de linguistiek een ware omwenteling veroorzaakt. En het interessante is nu dat de theorieën van Chomsky in precies de tegenovergestelde richting wijzen als de theorieën van Foucault. Chomsky zet het subject veel meer in het centrum. Is Sunday teasing us calling Dutch French? No, what I'm revealing is that I wasn't listening to the dialogue at all. I was just reading. <laughs> I actually I actually had this this thing muted. I'm only seeing the volume on here. I I assumed he was French. Bij de confrontatie dus van deze twee geheel verschillende denkers is het verder goed om te bedenken dat zij beide ook erg verschillend werk doen. Foucault is een cultuuronderzoeker, Chomsky is een taalonderzoeker. Of nog anders gezegd, Foucault interesseert zich erg voor de geschiedenis van de wetenschappelijke taal, Chomsky interesseert zich erg voor de taal die we gebruiken, de dagelijkse taal. Het is op zich interessant en misschien ook niet toevallig dat het debat tussen deze twee pas echt fel en spannend wordt in de tweede helft als het gaat over de politiek. Toch is het geloof ik goed dat er een stuk theorie aan vooraf gaat. Want in een discussie over filosofie en maatschappij gaat het er tenslotte niet om welk toevallig politiek standpunt bepaalde denkers innemen. Maar is het natuurlijk van groot belang om te zien vanuit welke argumenten of ze dat zullen doen. Het is misschien ook wel leuk dat deze discussie plaatsvond in de hal van het auditorium van de Technische Hogeschool in Eindhoven. Een discussie namelijk tussen twee filosofen, twee onderzoekers, wier werk zich kenmerkt door een grote precisie, een grote gedetailleerdheid en ook een grote helderheid. En verder vond ik het wel symbolisch dat het plaatsvond in een ruimte met veel glas. Binnen- en buitenwereld liepen door elkaar. Tijdens de uitzending zag je het verkeer buiten rijden. Symbolisch inderdaad omdat de relatie tussen binnen- en buitenwereld voorop staat in het eerste stuk van het vierde filosofendebat over menselijke natuur en ideale maatschappij. God, that is the most ableist stage entrance possible. <laughs> Can you imagine? Oh my god. Yeah, just, just enter, enter the stage down this massive flight of stairs, guys. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome at the fourth debate of the International Philosophers Project. Tonight's debaters are Mr. Michel Foucault of the Collège de France and Mr. Noam Chomsky. This guy looks like Xander Hall if he was the son of God. Of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. 
Both philosophers have points in common and points of difference. Perhaps the best way to compare both philosophers is to look at them as mountain diggers working at the opposite sides of the same mountains with different tools without knowing even if they are working in each other's direction. They both hate this sentence so much and you can tell. <laughs> it's like, oh, can you imagine like the arrogance it takes to say that about like two like social theorists and academics of this caliber? It's like, I observe you from my God's eye view and I see that you are both working in the exact same direction because I have encompassed all that you are researching and all that you know. The moderator kind of looks at you. How? It's because he's like pasty and he wears cozy, dweeby clothing? That's not enough. All learning concerning men, ranging from history to linguistics <clears throat> and psychology, are faced with the question whether in the last instance we are the product of all kinds of external factors or if, in spite of our differences, we have something we could call a common human nature by which we can call each other human beings. So my first question is to Mr. Chomsky, because you, Mr. Chomsky, employ often the concept of human nature, and even in this connection you are using terms like innate ideas and innate structures. Which arguments can you derive from linguistics in order to give such a central position to this notion of human nature? Well, let me uh, begin in a slightly technical way. A person who's interested in studying language is faced with, the, with a very definite empirical problem. He's faced with an organism, a mature, uh, let's say, adult speaker, who has somehow acquired an amazing range of abilities which enable him in particular to uh, say what he means, to understand what people say to him, to do this in a, in a fashion that I think it's proper to call highly creative. Now, the person who's acquired this intricate and highly articulated and organized uh, collection of abilities, the collection of... Jelma, shut up. No, he doesn't. That How dare you? Knowing a language, that person has been exposed to a certain experience. He has been presented in, his, in the course of his lifetime with a certain amount of, of data, uh, of, inform of direct data, experience with up. the language. <clears throat> and we can investigate the data that's available to this person. And having done so, in principle, we're faced with a very clear and a reasonably clear and, and well-delineated scientific problem, namely the problem of accounting for the gap between the really quite small quantity of data, small and rather degenerate quantity of data that's presented to the person, to the child, and the very highly articulated, highly systematic, uh, profoundly organized uh, resulting knowledge that... By the way, friends, just a quick reminder, because I see I have to manually skip ads and I will sometimes miss them. I try as often as possible to skip ads when I'm doing theory streams because that's educational stuff. Um, if you want to help out the channel and help make your fellow viewers' lives a little bit more enjoyable, your fellow viewers' viewing experience a little bit better, um, you can gift memberships on YouTube. And chat, remember to set it so that you can be gifted memberships in your settings so that other people, if you can't for whatever reason purchase a membership, our lowest tier is 99 cents Canadian, which is not very much, um, you can skip ads and so on and so forth, I believe. Um, we're also having our first members-only stream on Sunday. We're going to be going, uh, basically, it, I, I, I needed to figure out some kind of perk for members. So on Sundays, we're going to be doing a members-only stream where I it's, it's chill, I chat with you, maybe we talk about stuff. Um, it can be serious, it can be less serious. It's a little bit more freeform. Um, and we're going to be playing through some kind of intellectually stimulating ambient game. In this case, we're going to be going through the entire Mist series, starting with the 2021 remake of Mist 1, and that's going to be this Sunday. Uh, all the normal, all the regular content will not be paywalled. I, I generally, re I refuse to paywall educational content or stuff like that. It's disadvantageous to the channel's growth. I also just have an ethical issue with it. 
Oh, very quickly. All right. So, uh, yeah, that's that. Let's press on. Grab me one, too. That he somehow derives from this data. Uh, furthermore, even more remarkable, we notice that in a wide range of languages, in fact... Will non-members be able to watch but not interact with chat? Non-members, you'll need to be a member to watch and interact. Um, if there are segments in there that I think are useful, um, I won't make those uh, members only. It's literally just the live stream VOD on Sundays. But it's it just it's just so that like there's some kind of perk for people with memberships. Does that make sense? All that have been studied seriously, there are... It also gives me an excuse to play Myst. Remarkable limitations on the kinds of system that emerge from the very different kinds of experience to which people are exposed. Well, this, there's only one possible explanation for, in, in a, in a, what one, one can say in a rather schematic fashion, uh, for this uh, remarkable phenomenon, namely the assumption that the individual himself uh, contributes uh, a good deal, an overwhelming part, in fact, of the general schematic structure and perhaps even of the specific content of the knowledge that he ultimately derives from this very scattered and limited experience. That is, to put it rather loosely, the child must begin with the knowledge, certainly not with the knowledge that he's hearing English or Dutch or French or something else, but he does start with the knowledge that he's hearing a human language of a very narrow and explicit type that permits a very small range of variation. And it's because he begins with that highly organized and very restrictive schematism that he's able to make the huge leap from scattered and degenerate data to highly organized knowledge. And I would claim then that this instinctive knowledge, if you like, this schematism that makes it possible to derive complex and intricate knowledge on the basis of very partial data is one fundamental constituent of human nature. But then I assume uh, that in other domains of human intelligence and other domains of human cognition and even behavior, uh, something of the same sort must be true. Well, the collection of this uh, mass of uh, innate scheme, uh, schematisms, uh, innate organi organizing principles, uh, which guides our social and intellectual uh, uh, and individual behavior, that's what I mean to refer to by the concept of human nature. I don't like that for the simple reason not because I think it's in, it's wrong, but what immediately makes me uneasy is that it seems like when you classify a set of capacities or a set of innate instincts or tendencies or behaviors or whatever as human nature, when you dub it with that name, you sort of artificially treat it as the plateau of a developmental process wherein change in those things no longer takes place. You immediately treat this as sort of the bedrock of, 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 of like the, the superstructure of, of human human behavior and, and invention and things like that after the fact when I don't think that's really how it works I think um, that underlying bedrock I think this is the nature of evolution it, it is itself constantly changing and it hasn't stopped changing yet well uh, Mr. Foucault um, if I'm thinking at your books like Histoire de la Folie et les mots les choses I got the impression that you are... History of Madness is really interesting, by the way. I have it on my shelf. I've, I've read bits of it. Working on a completely different uh, level and also just with an opposite aim, opposite goal. If I'm thinking about the word schematism in relation to human nature, then you are just trying to work out that there are several periods, several uh, schematisms. What do you think about this? Well, if you permit, I will uh, answer in French because my English is so bad that I would be ashamed to uh, uh, answer in English. Uh, là, il est vrai que je me méfie un peu de cette notion de my man. humaine. Mais je m'en méfie pour la raison suivante. Je crois que parmi les concepts, parmi les notions dont une science peut se servir, Il y a évidemment des notions euh, qui, qui sont d'un niveau 
qui sont qui ont une élaboration. Very quickly, I'm going to open up the transcript on my end. So if uh, if there's some difficulty understanding what's being said, we uh, we have it ready to go. Wait, that's the Jewish state. No, I need the. Uh, hang on. You know what we'll do? I'm going to pop this into the same uh, thing here. So if, for whatever reason, we have difficulty uh, following along, we can refer to that and I'll set it up with the uh, PDF scale. There we go. Okay. ...qui est une fonction différente. Par exemple, bon, prenons le cas de la biologie. À l'intérieur, dans le domaine de la biologie, vous avez des concepts qui sont plus ou moins bien établis, comme le, le, le concept de réflexe. Bon. Et puis, vous avez d'autres notions qui sont en quelque sorte des notions périphériques. Des notions périphériques qui ne jouent pas un rôle euh, en quelque sorte organisateur à l'intérieur de la science, des concepts qui ne sont pas des instruments d'analyse, des concepts qui ne sont pas descriptifs non plus. Ce sont des notions, en quelque sorte, qui servent simplement à indiquer des problèmes ou encore qui servent à indiquer des domaines d'objets à étudier. Prenez, par exemple, il y a une notion comme ça qui, est, je crois, qui a, je crois, été très importante dans l'histoire de la biologie. C'est tout simplement euh, la notion de vie. Bon, euh, au XVIIe ou au XVIIIe siècle, les gens qui étudiaient la nature ne se servaient pas du concept de vie. Ils classaient les êtres naturels, qu'ils soient vivants ou non vivants, dans une espèce de grand tableau ou de grande hiérarchie. La vie était une notion dont ils ne se servaient pas et dont ils n'avaient pas besoin. Et puis, à la fin du XVIIIe siècle, un certain nombre de problèmes se sont posés, comme par exemple les problèmes de l'organisation intérieure, de ces êtres dont on avait fait la classification. Ou bien encore, avec les progrès du euh, euh, microscope, le microscope d'Amici, on a vu apparaître tout un tas de phénomènes qui n'avaient pas été jusque-là encore perçus et dont les mécanismes, dont le fonctionnement n'était pas encore clair. Euh, les progrès de la chimie ont fait également apparaître les problèmes concernant les rapports entre les réactions chimiques et les processus physiologiques de l'organisme. Et voilà que tout un domaine d'objet est... So this is almost a weirdly Aristotelian metaphysics right now without the essentialism, essential versus accidental properties, so it's replacing essence with structure. I think that's an elegant way to put that actually, Jama. I like that. Replacing essence with structure. I think that's... That's a... That's a... That's a nice way to put it. I haven't... I haven't seen it reflected... I haven't seen like uh, that that notion sort of reflected against the Aristotelian notion in quite that way. I actually like that phrasing. I'll think about that. Est apparu domaine d'objet absolument nouveau pour le biologiste, et c'est cela qui a été appelé la vie. Et la vie, c'était une notion qui servait à indiquer le champ des objets et des domaines nouveaux que la science avait à parcourir. Bon, bon. et je dirais. Comme ça, en historien des sciences, si vous voulez, que la notion de vie a été un indicateur épistémologique, un index des problèmes à parcourir. Et je me demande si on ne pourrait pas dire la même chose de la nature humaine. This is a really good argument. I'm actually... So, this is actually very similar, and there are reasons why it's very similar to Judith Butler's treatment of gender and, and sex, and, and namely her critique of the manner in which we speak of these things, as if they were a kind of metaphysical substance. And this is sort of what Foucault's hitting on here. Um, when we think of life, even, even as a thing that needs to be defined, as in some way apart from the world, we're treating what is really some discrete set of objects that have these sort of reproducing dynamic properties about them. These, the, the, in some sense, they're these kind of like semi-closed systems. Um, we're treating this as, in essence, something distinct from the things around them. And you even see this in, like, our, our fantasy, right? Like, when we, when we write, like, fiction, um, 
we will treat death and life as if they are substances, as if there is some kind of uh, corrupting or nourishing or whatever sort of quality about them. Um, if anyone's seen Fantasia 2000, the uh, the Firebird uh, animation at the end is, is actually like more or less an explicit rendition of this. This is super interesting. This is super interesting. I'm going to run to the washroom quickly and then we're going to press on, okay? I am... I am... Oh, I'm so glad we're looking at this in that wick. So glad. <laughs> Dear Lord. I'll be right back. Alright, let's keep going. Foucault vergelijkt dus het begrip menselijke natuur van Chomsky met het begrip leven in de biologie en in de geschiedenis van dat vak. En hij doet dat omdat hij dat begrip menselijke natuur eerder ziet als een aanwijzing voor een onderzoeksprogramma dan als een aanwijzing voor het feit dat de mens... Oké, okay, so I, I'm going to clarify this again a little bit further. Um, Foucault is characterizing this as... An uh, here, let, let me go back a tiny bit. I want to get the, the language correct. So if we go... ...van dat vak. En hij doet dat omdat hij dat begrip menselijke natuur eerder ziet... Oké, okay, so the indication of a research program. So the notion of life is the indication of a research program. I take this to mean the indication of a territory to be explored. And you can think of a substance as essentially that. This is a domain of things to be studied. Um, and I think, I think what Foucault is going to get into is this idea of human nature. We're essentially coloring over the human organism with this, this shape, right? This, this, this weird little pseudo essence that sort of characterizes its properties apart from the actual thing. And I, I think that's sort of where he's going, he's going to go with this. So it sounds mundane, the indication of a research program, but I think it's a bit, it's, it's actually a bit more serious than that. Um, it's not merely the indication of a research program. It indicates a research program by tacitly asserting the domain itself as a distinct entity. And, and so there's the, the postulation with the notion of life as a field of study, as a research program, that life is a distinct thing in the universe. Life as a category, not individual organisms as being things that systems that you can sort of like identify and understand as such, but as systems of a particular, of a particular type that are sort of colored differently against, against the, the background dross or something like that. Als een aanwijzing voor een onderzoek. Let me check Discord quickly to see if uh, Brooks is yelling at me. He's not, so I'll take that to me and I'm, I'm, I'm within, my, within my rights. Programma, dan als een aanwijzing voor het feit dat de mens uit zichzelf zo verschrikkelijk veel klaar zou kunnen spelen. Voor hem is dat begrip menselijke natuur eigenlijk een soort van wetenschappelijk boodschappenlijstje en niet meer dan dat. En Chomsky wil dit wel accepteren als maar duidelijk is dat vakken als biologie, fysiologie en neurologie voorlopig nog helemaal niet over de middelen beschikken om die menselijke natuur en dat taalvermogen adequaat te kunnen beschrijven. Vrij vroeg is het debat zo aangeland op een punt waar het... That's not how, oh, no, okay, never mind, Brooks is yelling in chat. That's not how I understand how he's doing this, it's a critique of categories. But that's, that's still a, I guess that, that could still like involve a critique of categories. No, I mean, that, that is a critique of a category. It's in essence what I'm saying, right? Gespreksleider Elders de grootste moeite zal kosten om de partners met elkaar in contact te houden. Voor een deel ligt het natuurlijk aan de taal die ze spreken, maar voor een veel groter deel ligt dat aan het feit dat Chomsky en Foucault ieder in een verschillende denkwereld zitten, zodat hun begrippen... What are you, what are you dotting at me for? What did I do? ...heel gemakkelijk langs elkaar heen glijden. We krijgen eigenlijk het merkwaardige schouwspel look, te look, zien... Look, look, I promise a theory stream. I don't promise I'm going to get it right, okay? Invite Brooks on. Does he want to come on? Uh, does he want to come on, Brooks? Do you want to come on? I swear to God, like all of my all of my patrons are gonna disappear as soon as Brooks dies. Son Brooks is so much better than Son Dick. All right, here we go. I just want you to that I hate you all. And how's your world? Oh, it's 
fine. It's fine. How are you? Fine. It's 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 lovely. It's going lovely. Things are lovely. You're doing lovely. It's uh, the 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 challenge with the the debate as it's going back and forth is they they genuinely aren't having the same conversation. It's one of the things that's kind of awesome about this, but also really a pain in the ass. Mm. Um, I don't know who the fuck this other dude is. So, um, here yeah. let me uh, let me share this with you quickly. All yes. right. There we go. One of the big things at this point for Foucault, um, oh, yeah. and it's important because Chomsky begins to sort of, uh, he directly responds to it, but again, they aren't really having the same conversation. Yeah. Um, he has that line in there um, where at the end of the 18th century, life was a category. It wasn't a category before that. It became a category because they sort of had to create a handful of elements uh, to begin sort of the next trellis of exploration. But as he says, um, uh, it seems more likely the transformations of biological knowledge at the end of the 18th century were demonstrated on one hand by a whole series of new concepts for use in scientific discourse, and on the other hand gave rise to a notion like that of life, which has enabled us to designate, delimit, and to situate a certain type of scientific discourse, among other things. I would say the notion of life is not a scientific concept, it has been an epistemological indicator of which the classifying, eliminating, and other functions had an effect on scientific discussion and not what they were actually talking about. It's a phenomenal, this is like a phenomenal Latourian style point about um, when you have these sort of things show up and it's his critique of the idea of human nature, obviously follows because that's where he, he's going with it. It's, it's not that we're studying human nature, it's that we basically had to create a new package, a new category in order to delimit the things that we're sort of learning, but also aim us in very particular directions. It's a nature of scientific knowledge uh, and knowledge in general and how concepts are created inside of it. Just a heads up, apparently there's a bit of a whine coming from your end. I don't, I don't think it's from, I don't think it's from me because people were only talking about it when you came live. So I think, you're, uh, I think your mic needs a little bit of adjustment if possible. I have no idea. All right. Well, we'll run with it. It'll, it'll be covered over by the debate anyway. So, um, yeah. But what I was getting at was because um, I'm I'm I, I've probably read more people who've read Foucault than I've read Foucault directly. So when I think of of Judith Butler, for example, I, I see sort of like from the the other end of that process, like the the sort of implied domain as itself constituting an entity that's just sort of taken for granted in later discourse about things like um, life, nature, et cetera, et cetera. And so working from that end, that that's sort of what I'm I was I was commenting on, um, because that that makes that makes a lot of sense from from there. Well, and, and and the line that nails it is that the one question: Can we say research into life has constituted itself in biological science? No, we have literally no way to actually define life in a meaningful way still. But by creating that moment where we can go, ah, this is alive, this is not, we can. We've immediately created the categories and the building in the direction we want, the, or the direction that is sort of is being conditioned by uh, the other forces at play. All right, let's uh, let's roll. Van twee breinen die gelijktijdig aan het denken zijn, en om de beurt een begrip oppikken uit het betoog van de ander, om dit begrip dan vervolgens te belichten. So van... uh, just for I don't know if you know this off the top of your head. I don't know why Kevin Bacon is is giving us a summary of of the conversation to this point. Is this like a part of the debate that's like you have face blindness that doesn't look anything like Kevin Bacon? Looks a ton like Kevin Bacon. What are you talking about? Look, say uh, Ferris Bueller's best friend. That may be a better one. Kevin Bacon. Yeah. Look. No. Just a little bit. He could play him. He's got the, he's got the same shape of face. Ah, yeah, whatever. Uit hun eigen denksysteem. Daarbij speelt dus voor Chomsky een grote rol dat begrip creativiteit, waarover nu een heel groot stuk van het debat zal gaan. Voor Chomsky is creativiteit eigenlijk een kenmerk van alle mensen. Iedereen werkt ermee. De verkeersdeelnemer die ter plaatse in een onverwachte situatie moet gaan bedenken wat hij zal doen. De opvoeder die niet terug wil vallen op autoritaire gedragspatronen en tegenover een lastige. Okay, hang on, I'm gonna make sure my AC is not making the noise. I'm pretty sure it's from you because no one's talking about it until you came on. If it's going in the last few last minute, it ain't me because I'm muted. Oh, 
Alright. Look, I'm baking for you guys. Don't say I don't do anything for you. Ik wil zelf nieuw gedrag moeten uitvinden. Maar vooral geldt deze creativiteit voor het kind dat een taal leert en dat daarbij merkwaardiger wijze. And for the record, I'm not face blind. I just see more of a face than you all do. I'm just more evolved than the rest of you. Leert om zelf nieuwe taal te produceren, te maken. Foucault staat daar tegenover. Hij vraagt voortdurend de aandacht voor het zogenoemde epistemologische veld waarbinnen de menselijke activiteit plaatsvindt. Dit epistemologische veld, oftewel episteme, wordt in het profiel omschreven als het geheel van niet bewuste regels die de algehele organisatie van onderling gescheiden velden van kennis beheersen. Foucault spreekt ook over tableau. Hij noemt het ook systeem van elementen. En in het debat valt ook het woord grille, trali of rooster. We kunnen misschien het best spreken van een netwerk waarbinnen iedereen in een bepaalde cultuur denkt of hij wil of niet. Het zijn eigenlijk regels waaraan het denken van iedereen gehoorzaamt en met behulp waarvan iedereen zoekt naar bepaalde identiteiten, samenhangen enzovoort. En dit netwerk nu is niet de... Fun fact, Foucault got paid with weed for this. He actually called it the Chomsky hash. Is that true? Chomsky hash. Oh, look at that. Foucault got paid in hash to debate Noam Chomsky. <clears throat> it's a very, that's a very Foucault thing. Huh. Uitvinding van bepaalde individuen. That's funny. Het bepaalt veel eer de regels van de denken en doe gewoonten van het denken en doe spel dat de cultuur noemt en waaraan ieder individu eigenlijk onderhorig is. Een dergelijk netwerk is ook geen ding of idee, maar het ligt precies tussen ding en idee in. En de geschiedenis van het denken is dan voor Foucault ook niet de geschiedenis van ideeën of zelfs zoiets als de ontwikkeling van de geest of iets dergelijks, maar veel eer de afwisseling van discontinue transformaties, van discontinue overgangen van het ene netwerk naar het andere. Dat is dus een heel andere aanzet dan die van Chomsky, bij wie die creativiteit in het centrum staat. En het is duidelijk dat we op dit punt bij Foucault weer diezelfde onttroning van het subject tegenkomen, waarover we in verband met Galilei in het begin reeds gesproken hebben. De filosofie van Foucault is een filosofie waarbij de filosoof zelf eigenlijk voortdurend uit het beeld verdwijnt. Ja, paradoxaal genoeg zou je moeten zeggen, het is eigenlijk een filosofie zonder filosoof en je moet dit ook nog generaliseren. By the way, very quickly, Wick, if you're watching this for whatever reason, I just want you to know, I got paid more than you made in your stream to turn your stream off. Hier, <laughs> Want de mens is bij Foucault in zekere zin de grote afwezige in zijn eigen cultuur. Ik vind het frustrerend dat hij eigenlijk een like like live going behind hem, like a sports thing he's commentating on. En we're going to take a break en I'm going to break yeah. this down for you while he continues to talk. And it's like, watch out, watch out, watch out, Foucault in the chair. En yeah. hij heeft kind of given, it's a really. I, I, what the fuck are we watching? It's just super. I think it's just, this is just the. the This has to be like for a philosophy class or No, no, no. Some... Look look how old this footage is. I think this is just literally the television presentation of it. I think this is what people watched back then. Like the in the the, the, the camera quality is the same. In Denmark on seven televisions. I mean, it's Foucault and Chomsky. It would have been like seven televisions anywhere. No. I think I think They're if you I think France. if you I think if you I think if you cared about this back then, you would probably either be reading about it or you'd go Maybe. I don't know. I'm not from then. Dat Foucault nogal fel en afwijzend reageert wanneer de gespreksleider belangstelling begint te vertonen voor privéaspecten van zijn bestaan. Wanneer Foucault debatteert, dan gaat het over alles behalve over Foucault zelf. Dit dus ter introductie op dit volgende, vrij uitvoerige theoretische stuk van het debat. Dat eigenlijk maar voortdurend allerlei aspecten van één hoofdvraag. Okay, if somebody can find, especially a widescreen version of this debate that doesn't have Doctor Who here, that would be fantastic. En wel de vraag: in hoeverre is de mens in staat iets nieuws te ontdekken? No offense to this guy, I'm sure he's swell. Als dat zo is, hoe moeten we dat dan begrijpen? We're here for the bald man. Het lijkt mij een relevante vraag, zeker als we bedenken 
dat we nogal wat nieuwe vormen van gedrag, kennis en wetenschap nodig zullen hebben, willen we het er in onze wereld met elkaar levend afbrengen. We nemen nu de draad weer op waar Foucault toe ligt, waarom hij aan de creativiteit van het individu in de geschiedenis niet zoveel aan No way, did he cut a part of the... Is this not a complete version? Hang on. God damn it. Let me let me find this. This is infuriating. <clears throat> Chomsky versus Foucault complete. I'm seeing bits of it. Do, is there like um Let me look. One sec. I'm seeing another one in a different language that's the same. I think we're just kind of stuck with that. I think I think we're actually just cursed. I think they I think when they published the debate it just it just had that guy cutting into it. I'm not I'm not seeing any other version of it. That's so fr why would they do that? That's so dumb. Oh. There is a version that's just the two of them. Where, where? Do you know where it is? This dude is in every single one I'm finding. Well, how long do do we have? Like, um, I mean, you can skip him. He's like, seriously, this debate is not an hour long. It's got to be fifteen to twenty minutes of this guy. It looks like he doesn't pop up again. Yeah, he does. Oh, he does. Fuck. Okay. Well, okay. We'll just we'll skip him when he pops just up. Just do it. We'll skip him. Fuck. We'll him. skip him. We'll skip him. Bestaat. Dans l'histoire traditionnelle des sciences, on oh, accorde so en effet le maximum, enfin la tradition veut qu'on accorde le maximum à la créativité des individus. L'histoire des sciences jusqu'à ces dernières années consistait essentiellement à montrer en quoi un individu, que ce soit Newton ou que ce soit Mendel, peu importe, avait été effectivement le créateur ou le découvreur plutôt d'une vérité qui était là, inscrite dans les choses et dans le monde, et que personne avant eux n'aurait vu. Le postulat qu'il y a, je crois, qui dort en quelque sorte sous l'histoire des sciences traditionnelles, c'est ceci. C'est que la vérité est là pour être connue et que pourtant l'esprit de l'homme À la, par la suite, par l'effet d'un certain nombre d'inhibitions ou d'obstacles, n'est pas parvenu à voir cette vérité. L'esprit de l'homme est fait pour voir la vérité et un obstacle contingent l'en empêche. Cet obstacle, ça peut être, eh bien, selon les historiens, les conditions économiques et sociales, ou ça peut être la forme des mentalités, ou ça peut être la crédulité Euh, euh, les vieux thèmes et mythes religieux, par exemple, ou moraux, enfin tout ceci qui constitue comme les obstacles, les écailles sur les yeux de celui qui voudrait voir. Mais en droit, l'esprit est fait pour voir, en droit, l'esprit est fait pour avoir accès à la vérité. Dans cette conception traditionnelle de l'histoire des sciences, d'une part, euh, si vous voulez, on donne toute la créativité à l'individu, qui est en droit possesseur de la vérité, et puis on la lui retire par le système des obstacles qui viennent d'une façon tout à fait contingente l'empêcher de saisir, de formuler, de construire cette vérité à laquelle il, est, euh, à laquelle il a droit en principe. Bon, alors moi, le, le problème qui s'est posé à moi, c'était précisément un peu l'inverse. Parce que qu'est-ce qui se passe quand on assiste à une... Euh, euh, à une grande transformation scientifique. Dans une transformation scientifique, comme par exemple la naissance de la biologie au milieu du XVIIe siècle, ou la naissance de la philologie à la fin du XVIIIe, au début du XIXe. C'est vrai qu'un certain nombre d'obstacles, un certain nombre de préjugés, un certain nombre d'idées toutes faites tombent et viennent à disparaître. Mais ce qui m'a frappé, c'est que une science au moment où elle naît, non seulement se débarrasse d'un certain nombre d'obstacles et d'obscurité, mais en même temps, elle supprime un certain nombre de savoirs et de connaissances existantes qu'elle occulte, qu'elle cache, 
comme si elle appliquait une grille nouvelle qui, tout en permettant de faire apparaître des phénomènes jusque-là cachés, cache des connaissances déjà acquises. Donc, une science, le progrès d'une science, c'est pas simplement l'oubli des vieux préjugés, ce sont pas simplement les obstacles qui tombent, c'est une véritable nouvelle grille qui cache un certain nombre de choses et du coup fait apparaître. Donc, en, quand je critique la, cré, la, la notion de créativité, je veux dire par là que, en fait, la vérité ne s'acquiert pas comme une sorte de création continue et cumulée, mais comme un jeu de grilles qui s'applique euh, les unes sur les autres, cachées. I think in part we're slightly talking in cross purposes because of a different use of the term creativity. In fact, I should say that my use of the term creativity is a little bit idiosyncratic and uh, therefore the onus falls on me, not on you in this case. But when I speak of creativity, I'm not uh, attributing to the concept the uh, notion of value that is normal when we speak of creativity. Mention, that is, yeah. the subtitles are really not a good translation. Are they not? No, and they also don't match the book and kind of don't match what he's saying. I don't speak perfect French, but uh, enough that it's like, oh. Okay. Well, I think we'll all. I think we'll have to go through the book at some point. Um, it shouldn't be long. It's the same debate, but. You speak of scientific creativity. You're speaking properly of the achievements of a Newton, but in the context in which I've been speaking about creativity, it's a normal human event. I'm speaking of the kind of creativity that any child uh, uh, demonstrates when he is able to come to grips with a new situation, uh, describe it properly, react to it properly, tell us something about it, uh, think about it in a new fashion for him, uh, and so on. These are, I think it's appropriate to call those creative acts, but of course without thinking of those acts as being the acts of a Newton. It's the uh, lower levels of creativity that I've been speaking of. Now, as far as what you say about the history of science is concerned, I think that's correct and illuminating and particularly relevant, in fact, to the kinds of enterprise that I see uh, uh, lying before us in psychology and linguistics and the philosophy of mind. That is, I think there are certain topics that have been, uh, what was your word, depressed or put aside during the uh, uh, scientific advances of the, say, past two centuries, century and a half. But now I think we can uh, overcome those, or it's possible to put aside those limitations and forgettings and to bring into our consideration precisely the topics that animated a good deal of the thinking and speculation of the 17th and 18th century and to incorporate it within a much broader and I think deeper uh, science of man that will uh, give fuller role, though certainly not hope to, will not hope to I think on the subject of translation, um, specifically yeah. from the French, I think it's appropriate here. Um, I think chat would probably they're find even They're cutting out stuff from... Yeah. This is edited. Well... My trans slow translation of anti -Oedipus. Sorry, I, am, I, I was muted. Sorry, just very quickly. What I was asking Brooks was just on the subject of translation. Um, I think chat would find it uh, kind of interesting, um, your your project that you've been working on for the last little while. Just because like what we're looking at here is, um, it seems to be a rough translation. Um, I don't know it's how It's also much an is editing just down because there's two significant points. Uh, in there... Uh, Chomsky brought up Descartes. Yeah. And that's Did just... you hear Descartes in the last 20 seconds? <laughs> no. No. So it's like, oh, this is interesting. That's, uh, hmm. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's it frustrations in general with uh, translations because I've, I, I've been doing uh, readings for anti Oedipus for now. Uh, we're going to be going on three and a half, four years. Um, and one of the things I learned early on, and someone said to me, and I thought was just the sort of, Eurocentric sort of French asshole, like, oh, no, you need to read it in the original French. And so I was like, fine. I did enough French once upon a time. I started, you know, going back up on it. 
And I learned very quickly that, yes, it's actually very different. And that the translations are not one-to-one -one and that people take a lot more literary license than they should. This is frustrating, though, because it's like entire paragraphs are missing of points he's making. Yeah, I notice he's taking, uh, Foucault is taking a very long time to say very little. Well, they're taking out a bunch from Foucault. Like yeah. There's, there's, but like, so uh, Chomsky's point here, uh, this concern with low level creativity I'm referring to was present in Descartes. For example, when he speaks of the difference between a parrot who can mimic what is said and a human who can say new things that are appropriate to the situation, when he specifies that uh, as being the, he specifies that as being the distinctive property that designates the limits of physics, carries us into science of mind to use modern terms, I think he's referring to the kind of creativity I have in mind. That's a very much more specific and finer point yeah. of what he's trying to say. Yeah. Uh, w w would that have all just been cut out back here? There's a lot going they, on. They just flat out cut it out and they just didn't acknowledge the edit. They did. Uh, it cuts to the audience. That's cheating. It doesn't count. Yeah, I mean, that's that's how you edit. No, no, I, I, no, no. I understand there, there is an edit in the camera, but what I mean is, there isn't an acknowledgement that this debate is an abridgment. That's, that's no, I mean. no, there's not. It, it is. Well, that sucks. Well, it does, doesn't it? This, that, I, I, the, look, look, guys. Um, our disappointment may be uh, immeasurable, and, and there's nothing that can make up for it. But the lesson is priceless. Um, everything is a lie. Complete understanding uh, to such notions as innovation and creativity and uh, freedom and uh, uh, production of new uh, entity, new elements of thought and behavior within some system of rule and schematism. Those are concepts that I think we can come to grips with. Je crois que entre ce qu'a dit Monsieur Chomsky à l'instant, de montrer, il y a en réalité beaucoup de ressemblances. C'est-à-dire qu'il n'y a en fait de création possible, d'innovation possible. On ne peut, dans l'ordre du langage ou dans l'ordre du savoir, produire quelque chose de nouveau qu'en mettant en jeu un certain nombre de règles, de règles qui vont définir l'acceptabilité ou la grammaticalité des énoncés ou qui va définir, dans le cas du savoir, la scientificité des énoncés. Alors, disons en gros que les linguistes avant M. Chomsky ont surtout insisté sur les règles de construction des énoncés et moins sur l'innovation que représente tout énoncé nouveau ou l'audition d'un énoncé nouveau. Et puis, dans l'histoire des sciences ou dans l'histoire de la pensée, on avait beaucoup plus l'habitude d'insister sur la création individuelle et on avait tenu euh, euh, à l'écart, on avait euh, laissé dans l'ombre ces espèces de règles communes, générales, qui sont en œuvre obscurément à travers euh, toute découverte scientifique, toute invention scientifique ou même d'ailleurs toute euh, innovation philosophique. Des règles non seulement linguistiques mais épistémologiques et qui caractérisent le savoir contemporain. Well, I think perhaps I can try to react to those comments uh, within my own framework in a way which maybe will shed some light on this. How is it that we're able to construct any kind of scientific theory at all? How is it that given a small amount of data, it's possible for various scientists, for various geniuses even over a long period of time, to arrive at some kind of a theory, at least in some cases, that is more or less profound and more or less empirically adequate? This is a remarkable fact. And in fact, if it were not the case that these... That's a good question, Callum. Who the fuck is trying to watch this but doesn't want to see the whole thing? Why on earth would an abridgment of this even exist? The, the thing is, can only be like two hours long at tops. Like, why, why, would, they, why would they cut it out at, at all? It's, it's so dumb. Well, and it's... And it's um, I can only assume that someone had an... Uh, so, uh, someone had a preconceived desire to make one look better than the other. Uh, this, 
they're not letting, first off, they're not letting Foucault really go into his points, which is frustrating. But Chomsky, like they literally cut out him and going back to these thought experiments. Literally, we just skipped over him talking about Martians. Who would ever cut out Chomsky talking about Martians? Uh, of all the fucking things. Not, uh, not me. So let's, uh. If a Martian were to look at this process of acquiring vast and complicated intricate systems of knowledge on the basis of this ridiculously small quantity of data, he would think of it as an immense act of invention and creation. In fact, a Martian would, I think, consider it as much of an achievement as the invention of, let's say, any aspect of physical theory on the basis of the data that was presented to the physicist. And it's, it's, this is where Chomsky's, Chomsky is compelling in what he's talking about in the creative act I, I think is interesting. It's... Oh, yeah, they cut... Oh, they, they, so the part we're just looking at, that's what they cut out there. Yeah. It's got all of that out, skipped four or five paragraphs. Given the time frame, do you think they were embarrassed by the Martian example? No, it's really good. Because, again, so Chomsky's thing is, hey, look, a kid makes inference. And that's kind of amazing. Whether the inference... Uh, you have Einstein who infers the theory of relativity. It's not like he, he he read it somewhere. He inferred it based on everything he learned. But a child inferring gravity or inferring anything is just as miraculous. That's his point. And he's not, I don't think he's wrong in that the creative act is a creative act. His question is, if a Martian or some impartial third-party observer were to see that all human children do this, the question is, would he chalk it up to the being and the replicated singular repetitive thing, which is a human child, or would he say there's other causes? That's his question. It's a fucking good, like, and, but again, Foucault has a good response to it, but it's like, this is not like shitty. This isn't shitty reasoning. It's really no. interesting. Like, this is why this is an interesting debate. Very frustrating. God damn it. I hate, I hate everyone. Okay. I'm going to close that and one. It, it even takes out Foucault's jokes. Because he, he rambles for like forever. And then Chomsky answers very quickly. And then they put it back to Foucault and he goes, I would ask you make your answers more brief, please. Which is funny. Because that's it. So you get it? Yeah. 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 Uh, Chad, if anybody, if anybody can find an uncut version of this, I don't care if it's just the audio. Well, I do care if it's just the audio because I can't, I can't understand French. But Very if you can find an uncut version of this, that would be, I would be so grateful. I will, I will, I don't know. I, I will, I will, I will send you, send you my ear signed in a box, okay? Including the geniuses, had, if they didn't have built into their minds, somehow, a, obviously unconscious specification of what is a possible scientific theory, then this inductive leap would certainly be quite impossible just as if each child did not have in, built into his mind the concept of human language in a very natural way, in a very narrowing way, then the inductive leap from data to knowledge of a language would be impossible. So even though the process of, let's say, deriving knowledge of physics from data is far more complex, far more difficult for us, for, for organisms such as us, far more drawn out in time, requires intervention of genius and so on and so forth, Nevertheless, in a certain sense, it the achievement of discovering physical science or biology or whatever you like is based on something rather similar to the achievement of the normal child in discovering the structure of his language. That is, it must be achieved on the basis of an initial limitation, an initial restriction on the class of possible theories. And the fact that science converges and progresses, that itself shows us that such initial limitations and structures exist. That is, I don't think that scientific progress is simply a matter of a cumulative addition of new knowledge and uh, uh, absorption of new theories and so on. Rather, I think it has this sort of jagged uh, pattern that you describe for getting certain problems and leaping to new theories and so on and so forth. It transforms les mêmes connaissances. Right. But I think that the explanation for that... That's from like five pages from now. Sorry. Sorry, I, 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 I'm, I'm seeing the edits now. Like there was a period where the the uh, audience you can hear volume, it in the audio, yeah. Like like the the audience suddenly went silent like that, and he kept on talking, but they cut it so you couldn't really notice the movement. 
And it was it was like zoomed out at the time. And, just like, and Foucault's response, because they skipped it, and I don't know if they're going to go back to it, but um, in what Mr. Chomsky has said, there is something which seems to me to create difficulty. Perhaps I understood it badly. I believe you have been talking about a limited number of possibilities in the order of a scientific theory. That is true if you limit yourself to a fairly short period of time, whatever it may be. But if you consider a longer period, it seems to me that what is striking is the proliferation of possibilities by divergences. For a long time, the idea has existed that the science's knowledge followed a certain line of progress, obeying the principle of growth and the principle of the convergence of all these kinds of knowledge. And yet, when one sees how the European understanding, which turned out to be a worldwide and universal understanding in a historical and geographical sense, developed, can one say there has been growth? I myself would say it has been much more of a matter of transformation. Fuck, he's so great. He, mm, sorry. It's just, it's a, a, Foucault's entire thing is talking about not just simply uh, structure, but instead how power and history is, is pushed through structure, how it forms structure, how it builds that. And Chomsky very much comes from, uh, I almost want to say the same sort of mindset that you see, uh, sort of the, um, sort of traditional psychoanalysts, they, I, I do a lot of Deleuze shit, so that's where my brain goes, but where they, there is this idea that people are always this way, look at how all these people, this pattern, must be something innate. That's why we have a nuclear family. That's why we have the Oedipus complex. That's why we have like the idea that these things are replicated everywhere instead of the historical power contingency that things are. It's a really fascinating uh, response, but again, Chomsky's not like shitty at this. It's his 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 arguments are important because it's what Foucault needs to be able to take down. It's really it's the only interesting thing is letting him make the arguments. So this is interesting. Um to your point about wanting to make one of the participants look better. Um and I think you assumed they wanted to make Chomsky look better than Foucault. Um, I don't know. I don't, well, apparently someone in chat, I haven't verified this of course, but someone in chat is saying uh, because this was on television, there's no known other versions. This is the only version of the debate that we have in, in video form. Um, where they got the recording for the book, then, I, I wonder. I guess we could look in the uh, table of contents for that. But in addition, um, they say that uh, the transcript was edited by Foucault. Now, I don't know if I'm supposed to take that to mean that the subtitles were edited by Foucault. Um, but... Or, or, or the book that we're looking at here was edited by Foucault. Maybe you could provide clarity on that. I don't know. I'm reading the intro right now while we talk. Yeah, but um, yeah, yeah, it just sucks. So I just, I just wanted the debate. I didn't want. Well, I mean, it. they're but they're cutting out stuff from Chomsky, from this that is included here. That I, I can't imagine. Like if Foucault, like edited down. I, I can't imagine. I can't imagine. I can't write Im in ways he wouldn't write it. I can't imagine Foucault, who learned five languages and who wrote voluminously, would cut down a two-hour debate to one hour for f with the the cost incurred. I, I can't I can't see him making that editorial decision. So I don't know what that means by the transcript. I don't know if that means like he went through and he made clarifications on the French, and then God knows if that was actually used for anything. But uh, yeah. I don't know. Nothing in here that's saying. An explanation for that fact. And uh, oversimplifying grossly, I really don't mean what I'm now going to say literally. It's as if, as human beings, a particular biologically given organism, we have in our heads, to start with, a certain set of possible intellectual structures, possible sciences. Okay? Now, in the lucky event that some aspect of reality happens to have the character of one of these structures in our mind, then we have a science. So, and it's because of this, it's because of this limitation, initial limitation in our minds to a certain kind of possible science, it's precisely that that provides the tremendous richness and creativity of scientific knowledge. That is, if it were not, it's important to stress that, this has to do with your point about limitation and freedom. If it were not for these limitations, we would not have the creative act of going from a little bit of knowledge 
a little bit of experience to a rich and highly articulated and complicated array of knowledge. It's precisely because of that that the progress of science, I think, has the uh, erratic and jagged and transformational character that you describe. And that doesn't mean that everything is ultimately going to fall within the domain of science. Quite the contrary. Personally, I believe that many of the things we would like to understand and maybe the things we would most like to understand, such as the nature of man or the nature of a decent right. society or lots of other things, might really fall be outside the scope of possible human sciences. Well, I think we have now two, uh, two questions out of this statement. Um, one question is, if you can agree, uh, Mr. Foucault, do you agree with the statement right. about a combination of limitation, fundamental limitation? Not a combination. Ce n'est pas, pas une affaire de, de combinaison. Il n'y a de créativité possible qu'à partir d'un système de règles. Ce n'est pas un mélange de régularité et de liberté. Une liberté ne s'exerce réellement que sur fond et à partir d'un réseau de régularité. Le problème, alors, là, que je me pose, et où je ne suis pas peut-être tout à fait d'accord avec M. Chomsky, c'est lorsque il place euh, ces régularités à l'intérieur, en quelque sorte, de l'esprit ou de la nature humaine. Je me demande si le système de régularité, de contrainte, qui rend possible une science, on ne peut pas les trouver ailleurs, en dehors même de l'esprit humain, dans des formes sociales, dans des rapports de production, dans les, les luttes de classe, etc. Mais well, quand même, qu'est-ce que la raison pour vous Right, and so, look, just as in, in very like rough, rough strokes. Um, the point he's making is that it's it's not satisfactory to simply locate um, the, the psychological and social restrictions by which free action is guided, by which like people are able to do things in, in a meaningful sense um, in, in like some model of human nature, whether it lives inside the genes or, or wherever else. Um, simply because it may be a convergence of factors, internal and external, or not even like a convergence of factors, it may literally be a thing that only exists in the convergence itself um, that gives that gives rise to this. So the the information, and I'm using that word, re recognizing that I've also read stuff that suggests that that's problematic, um, that sort of gives the structure in which freedom moves. Um, there's no reason necessarily to think that that is specifically emergent from a... Uh, human beings described accurately, it may be that what we call freedom, all that stuff, that is itself, uh, the, 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 that structure, that is itself uh, erected between several things that may be even entirely sort of extrinsic to how the human organism is arranged. Whereas Chomsky seems to be thinking there's something sort of innate born in a human being uh, un, unrelated to its, its social or environmental context. That gives rise to like certain the the limitations they're talking about that sort of make the labyrinth that is um, the the realm in which you can exercise freedom. Is that is that a fair is that a fair approximation of what his point is? I think that's that's seems kind of clear to me. Yeah, uh, I would add the transcript we're reading in the book is also what Chomsky has on his official website, and there's no source on who transcribed or who did any of that. Oh, brilliant! So, Wonderful. so it's both both sides, same thing. parler euh, de temps en temps de la mort de l'homme ou euh, du fin de, de la période 19e, 20e siècle, n'est-ce pas Mais ça n'a pas de rapport ouais. avec, avec ce que nous disons. Là. Ah, je ne sais pas, parce que je pense à... Euh, euh, comme vous, je traite d'appliquer oh, hey, ce que vous avez dit euh, à votre notion anthropologique. Et vous avez refusé déjà de parler sur votre propre... Créativité et liberté, n'est-ce pas Alors, qu'est-ce qu'elle a la raison Quelles sont les raisons psychologiques, je me demande Mais quelles sont, peut-être, ah, c'est plus vous important. Vous le demandez, mais moi, je, ah, bien. je, je Mais quelles sont pas. les raisons, euh, hein, laissez-nous dire, euh, plus objectives, peut-être, pour vous, euh, votre conception de savoir, de, de, la, de la connaissance, de la science, pour refuser de répondre à des questions personnelles, n'est-ce pas Ça a fait quelque chose avec votre conception euh, de la société. Alors, euh, quand il y a un problème ici pour vous, qu'est-ce que sont les raisons de faire un problème d'une question personnelle 
Mais non, je ne fais pas du tout un problème d'une question personnelle. Je fais d'une question personnelle une absence de problème. C'est-à-dire que dans toute l'histoire traditionnelle des pens de la pensée, des idées et des sciences, on s'est toujours posé le problème de savoir à quel âge Newton avait dû être sevré pour concevoir la gravitation universelle. À quelle époque est-ce que Cuvier euh, avait rencontré sa première maîtresse pour pouvoir finalement découvrir les fossiles, l'anatomie comparée, etc. Ce genre d'analyse, enfin que je caricature, ce genre d'analyse, et je crois sans intérêt, il est beaucoup plus intéressant de saisir les transformations d'un savoir en général à l'intérieur, à la fois du domaine général des sciences et également de ce domaine en quelque sorte vertical que constitue une société, une culture, une civilisation à un moment donné. Et quand on saisit l'ensemble de la transformation, à ce moment-là, eh bien, on s'aperçoit que les petits événements individuels de la vie du savant n'est pas important. Opnieuw verdwijnt en deze laatste opmerking van Fou. Don't care. All right. Mogen niet logisch uit elkaar voortvloeien. Dat, um, oké. Okay. I don't... What does the, um... What does the, tr the, uh, the book say about that weird kind of... Puzz 3D relationship between science and, and society and whatnot? What, what Which is... Which time? Oh, God. I um, mean, it's... It's not small. And... <laughs> I know this thing's like 200 pages long. Um, well, yeah, a lot of it is excess, is like addendums and other essays about the thing that were written by Chomsky and Foucault after the fact. So a lot of it isn't, though. I'm looking through it right now, and it's like it no, goes. no, it's it's a chunk. Yeah. Okay. Ze lopen wel degelijk parallel. Well, let, let me get, begin by referring to something that I've already discussed. That is, if it is correct, as I believe it is, that a fundamental element of human nature is the need for uh, creative work, for creative inquiry, for, uh, for free creation uh, without the arbitrary limiting effects of coercive institutions, then, of course, it will follow that a decent society should maximize the possibilities for this fundamental human characteristic to be realized. in which the creative urge the, uh, that I think is intrinsic to human nature will in fact be able to realize itself in whatever way it will. I don't know all the ways in which it will. Je suis dans, mo dans ma démarche beaucoup moins avancée, je vais beaucoup moins loin que M. Chomsky, c'est-à-dire que j'avoue euh, n'être pas capable de définir, il n'y a plus forte raison de proposer un modèle de fonctionnement social idéal pour notre société euh, scientifique ou technologique. Can I just can I just comment on this very quickly because this immediately came to mind. So I would say that I am much less advanced than Chomsky in this respect. C'est-à-dire que I am not I admit not being able to define not even to propose. De définir, il n'y a plus forte raison de proposer un modèle an ideal social model for the functioning of our scientific or technological society. And I, I'm listening to this. 2.2 million people have viewed this. Um, and and you have utter shitheads like Jordan Peterson saying that Michel Foucault, by name, um, was a, his entire project was to attempt to justify the Soviet Union by other means because they saw it fail, or to justify communism by other means. It's 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 crazy that this is even possible. Like just the level of overt lies about people's positions. The fonctionnement social ideal pour notre société. And, and what's what's crazy too is like people went on talking about like how oh no Jordan Peterson is like a shithead or whatever he doesn't know anything. But nobody pointed stuff, obvious stuff like this out, like at all. Like there, there, there were so many people who who probably could have very easily, and just nobody did. But I remember watching that when I was like fresh and I was like a teenager. Let's skip thirteen pages right there, by the way, between the two of them. That that edit, thirteen pages.
Yep. Uh, if the next sentence isn't, uh, on the other hand, one of the tasks that seems immediate and urgent to me, I'm going to be kind of pissed because that's kind of his actual response. Okay, so on the other hand... Okay, so here we go. So this is what uh, he says. I'd go much less far than Mr. Chomsky, that is to say that I admit not being able to define nor for even stronger reasons to propose an ideal social model for the functioning of our scientific or technological society. On the other hand, one of the tasks that seems immediate and urgent to me over and above everything else anything else rather, is this, that we should indicate and show up even where they are hidden all the relationships of political power which actually control the social body and oppress or repress it. Oppress. What I want to say is this, it is the custom, at least in European society, to consider that power is localized in the hands of the government and that it is exercised through a certain number of particular institutions such as administration, the police, the army, or the apparatus of the state. One knows that all these institutions are made to elaborate and to transmit a certain number of decisions in the name of the nation or the state, to have them applied and to punish those who don't obey. But I believe the political power also exercises itself through the mediation of a certain number of institutions, which look as if they have nothing in common with the political power and as if they are independent of it, while they are not. That's a great, that's a great paragraph, it's a great bit. This is like good Foucault. Here, let, let me finish this last one. One knows this in relation to the family, and one knows that the university, and in a general way, all teaching systems, which appear simply to disseminate knowledge, are made to maintain a certain social class and power, and to exclude the instruments of power of another social class. Institutions of knowledge, of foresight and care, such as medicine, also help to support the political power. It's also obvious even to the point of scandal in certain cases related to psychiatry. I think they're just going to skip right over this. I, I hope they don't, because I wouldn't mind having it reiterated in his lovely French. On the other hand, good. And he's, and he's spot on as he's saying this. I mean, you can let it play because it's people are reading it anyway. He's spot on as he's saying this. Because in America, Canada too, people think of the government or state or power as the capital buildings or the police or fired up. Like they, they do all this, but they forget how power is distributed everywhere. They forget almost everything that's involved in it. And this is, I mean, that's effectively Foucault's whole thing. <laughs> Basically. Basically. Il s'exerce en outre, de plus, par oh, l'intermédiaire d'un certain nombre, nombre d'institutions qui ont l'air comme ça de n'avoir rien de commun avec le pouvoir. Okay, you know what I'm noticing here as well? So the translation here actually seems to correspond very much to the book version that we're looking at at the moment, like to a T. Mm -hmm. So I do wonder if the transcript that used for YouTube had multiple authors. It's possible. Yeah. I, it's, it's also possible that, like, they just translate the same. And some sentences, you can only really translate one way. Like it, it doesn't really work to make it more complex. It's when you get into the little things or the edges or when someone's speaking with a little bit of poetry. Qui ont l'air d'en être indépendantes et qui ne le sont pas. On sait bien... Oh, it looks like they got the whole thing. D'une façon générale, tout le système scolaire qui, en apparence... And this is going back to his earlier point on science and scientific knowledge and the idea of life, what life means, where it cuts things off, how it does that, and how human nature is doing the same thing as a epistemological moment. psychiatries. Uh, uh, la psychiatrie est encore d'une certaine manière de faire peser un pouvoir. Oh, see, that's a that's a crazy difference right there. Bit of a switch. That's a that's a big switch. That the the sentence is radically different. So what's actually said here is institutions of knowledge of foresight and care, such as medicine, also help to support the political power. It's also obvious even to the point of scandal in certain cases related to psychiatry. Um. Where even is this? Hang on. Let's, let's get back to yeah, where, where it, it cuts it, off. It, it, again, it's a question of when he says medicine, the way he's saying it, the way he's talking about it, it 
You could, again, inferring being the creative part of the conversation as Chomsky's talking about it here, that people infer a lot of that shit. And he's not literally saying these things, but you can make those leaps. It's not like he wasn't in the anti-psychiatry movement, for God's sake. No, no, sure, but okay, just hang on. So, exclude the instruments of power of another social class. So that's, that's a direct translation. The next line Ooh. should be institution. Exclure des instruments du, du pouvoir, uh, toute une autre classe sociale. Quel... What is that? That is so weird. So the next line is institution. So right after this, uh, uh, the university and general royal teaching systems, which appear to simply disseminate knowledge, are made to maintain a certain social class in power and to exclude the instruments of power of another social class. Perfect translation on, on this. There's a perfect correspondence between the book and the and the debate on screen. The next line is institutions of knowledge of foresight and care, such as medicine, also help to support the political power. It's also obvious, even to the point of scandal, in certain cases related to psychiatry. Instead, he says this. Actually, let me see if I can't find another example is. I wonder if that's. Th that, that sentence isn't even in the transcript here, so I, I don't know what's going on. Quelque chose comme la psychiatrie, qui en apparence aussi n'est destinée qu'au bien de l'humanité et à la connaissance des psychiatres, euh, euh, la psychiatrie est encore une certaine manière de faire peser un pouvoir politique sur un groupe social. La justice également. Bon, et il me semble que la tâche politique actuelle dans une société comme la nôtre, yeah, he doesn't even mention institutions of justice here. He says institutions of knowledge, of foresight, and care. Huh. De critiquer le jeu des institutions apparemment les plus neutres et les plus indépendantes, de les critiquer, de l'attaquer de telle manière Crazy, I'm going to rewind a little bit because people missed that. Également. Bon, et il me semble que la tâche politique That's actuelle dans une société comme la nôtre, c'est de critiquer le jeu des institutions apparemment les plus neutres et les plus indépendantes, de les critiquer, de l'attaquer de telle manière que la violence politique qui s'exerçait obscurément en eux surgisse et pour qu'on puisse lutter contre elle. À vouloir tout de suite, enfin si on cherche tout de suite à donner le profil et la formule de la société future Sans avoir bien fait la critique and you see that there, so he repeats right away twice, but that's not in the in the text at all. Les rapports de violence politique qui exercent qui s'exercent dans notre société, on risque de les laisser se reconstituer, même à travers des formes aussi aussi nobles, apparemment aussi pures que celles du syndicalisme anarchiste. Yes, I, I would certainly agree with that. Uh, not only in theory, but also in action. That is, uh, there are two intellectual tasks, one and the one which I was discussing, to try to create the vision of a future just society. Uh, another task is to understand very clearly the nature of power and oppression and terror and destruction in our own society. Uh, and that certainly includes the institutions you mentioned, as well as the central institutions of any industrial society, namely the uh, the economic, commercial, and financial institutions, in particular, in the coming period, the great multinational corporations, which are not very far from us physically tonight. Uh, those are the basic institutions of uh, oppression and coercion and autocratic rule. What is he, do you know what he has in mind when he says that? Because people were laughing. Um, is there something about the venue or? Yeah, Phil Phillips at Eindhoven. It's in the text, the, the joke he's making. He's there doing the thing at the thing is kind of the joke. Got it. That appear to be neutral. After all, they say, well, we're subject to the democracy of the marketplace. Still, I think it would be a great shame to lose or to put aside entirely the somewhat more abstract and philosophical, if you like, task of trying to draw the connections between a concept of human nature that gives full scope to freedom and dignity and creativity and other fundamental human characteristics uh, and relates that to uh, some notion of social structure in which 
those properties could be realized in which meaningful human life could take place. And in fact, if we are thinking of social transformation or social revolution, though it would be absurd, of course, to try to draw out in detail the point that we're hoping to reach, still we should know something about where we think we're going. And such a theory may tell it to us. Oui, mais alors là, est-ce qu'il n'y a pas un danger? Si on dit que il existe une certaine nature humaine, que cette nature humaine n'a pas reçu dans la société actuelle les droits et les possibilités qui lui permettraient de se réaliser. C'est bien ce que vous avez dit, je crois. Et si on admet cela, est-ce qu'on ne risque pas de définir cette nature humaine à la fois idéale et réelle, cette nature humaine cachée et réprimée jusqu'à présent, est-ce qu'on ne risque pas de la définir dans des termes que nous empruntons à notre société, à notre civilisation, à notre culture. Je vais prendre un exemple qui est un peu caricatural. Mais le marxisme d'une certaine époque, à la fin du 19e, au début du 20e siècle, le marxisme admettait en effet que dans la société capitaliste, l'homme ne recevait pas toutes ses possibilités de développement et de réalisation que la nature humaine était effectivement aliénée dans le système capitaliste. Et le marxisme rêvait d'une nature humaine enfin libérée. Or, cette nature humaine, quel modèle utilisait-il le marxisme de cette époque-là, du 19e, du début du 20e siècle Quel modèle utilisait-il pour la concevoir, pour la rêver C'était en réalité le modèle bourgeois. Euh, le marxisme a considéré qu'une société heureuse, c'était une société qui faisait place, par exemple, à une sexualité de type bourgeois, à une famille de type bourgeois, à une euh, esthétique de type bourgeois. Et c'est d'ailleurs tellement vrai que c'est comme ça que ça s'est passé, passé en Union soviétique, où sous prétexte de réaliser une société où l'homme réaliserait enfin sa nature, on a reconstitué une espèce de société à la fois réelle et utopique qui est transposée de la société bourgeoise du 19e siècle. De sorte que, est-ce que la notion de nature humaine, vous-même, en commençant, vous reconnaissiez, je crois qu'on ne savait pas très bien ce que c'était que cette nature humaine. <rire> Alors, est-ce qu'il ne risque pas de nous induire en erreur Vous savez que Mao Tse-tung parlait de nature humaine bourgeoise et de nature humaine prolétarienne. Et il considère que ce n'est pas la même chose. Well, you see, I think that in the... Okay, and so the, the, the I, I guess the, the perverse conflation that he's pointing out is that, and I have, I have, I've actually talked about this with respect to like Greek notions of freedom and things like that, um, and spontaneity and, and autonomy. When they conceive of human nature as liberated from the sort of conditioning shackles of like the, the, the social structure in which they're embedded and like capitalist structure, the notion of what is freed is itself simply like a reification of that it is just exactly the ideal bourgeois notion itself so when they when they imagine um a human being freed from capitalism they really just imagine the exact same ideal for a human being as is imagined by uh, ideological um fetishizations of of capitalism as being essential to human flourishing they see the exact same picture more or less not exactly in the same terms as like the, the 50s picture of the, the family, the white family in the summer backyard barbecue thing, but but similar. Well, I mean, I would, I would say that um, the Marxist answer would be, yeah, it turns out that uh, people are determined by material conditions, especially with the things we idealize inside of those material conditions. Yeah. Intellectual domain of political action. Well, I, th I think it's why it's critical that he, and again, like I'm, I'm running off of the translation, so that he specifies Marxists or Marxism. He doesn't really specify specific Marxists, so he may be talking about like somebody more vulgar than like Marx and Engels, right? That is the domain it's, it's, of uh, he's, he's speaking of, uh, the way he sort of phrased it, it was, it was around, um, it wasn't like Marx. He was saying um, the Marxists of uh, like early pre-Soviet Union or the like that era. Like yeah. he, was, he was talking about the Marxists of that era. Yeah. He, he was talking about the old timies a vision of a just and free society on the basis of some notion of human nature 
in that domain, we face the very same problem that we face in immediate political action. For example, to be quite concrete, uh, a lot of my own activity really has to do with the Vietnam War, and a good deal of my own energy goes into civil disobedience. Well, civil disobedience uh, in the United States uh, is an action undertaken uh, in the face of great uns of considerable uncertainties about its effects. Uh, for example, it threatens the social order in ways which, let's say, might, one might argue, bring on fascism. That would be very bad for, the, for America, for Vietnam, for Holland, and for everyone else. So there is a danger that is one danger in undertaking this concrete act. On the other hand, there's a great danger in not undertaking it. Namely, if you don't undertake it, uh, the society of Indo Indochina will be torn to shreds by American power. And in the face of those uncertainties, one has to choose a course of action. Well, similarly, in the intellectual domain, uh, one is faced with the uncertainties that you correctly pose. Our concept of human nature is certainly limited, partial, socially conditioned, constrained by our own character defects and the defects and the limitations of the intellectual culture in which we exist. Yet at the same time, it's of critical importance that we have some, some direction, that we know uh, what impossible goals we're trying to achieve if we hope to achieve some of the possible goals. And that means that we have to be bold enough to speculate and create social theories on the basis of partial knowledge while remaining very open to the uh, strong possibility, in fact, overwhelming probability, that at least in some respects we're very far off the mark. Well, perhaps it is interesting to, um, to go on a little bit farther on this problem of strategy. So, for example, in the case of Holland... How are they screwing uh, up the English translation? Like, uh, population They're cutting. You were obliged to mm. fill in your papers and so on, you know. So this you would call if you are not filling in your papers, civil disobedience. Right. Now, I, I would be a little careful. No, I mean like the, the subtitle like literally just didn't reflect what the guy was saying. Because, uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, going back to some very important point that Mr. Foucault made, one does not necessarily allow the state to define what is legal. Now, the state has the power to enforce a certain concept of what is legal, but power doesn't imply justice or correctness even. So the state may define something as... Well, neither does legal, though. ...may be wrong in doing so. For example, in the United States, the state defines it as civil disobedience to let's say, derail an ammunition train that's going to Vietnam. And the state is wrong in defining that as civil disobedience because it's legal and proper and should be done. It's proper to carry out actions that will prevent the criminal acts of the state. Hey, hang on, slow down. Oh, you're gonna, your head's going to explode when you start getting into how Chomsky views the state. Completely different. Well, he, he, there's, there's like a fundamental conflation here of the legal and the just, which is bizarre to me because this is like... This is like a common thread going back to fucking Melville, that there, there is a, a firm distinction between the legal and the just. In fact, if there wasn't a distinction between the legal and the just, um, the, the legal would be superfluous. You would simply talk about the just. No. And the state is wrong in defining that as civil disobedience because it's legal and proper and should be done. It's proper to carry out actions that will prevent the criminal acts of the state, just as it's proper to violate a traffic ordinance in order to prevent a murder. If I was standing at a street corner and the traffic light were red, let's say I was standing in my car and I drove across the yeah, the, these are these aren't these aren't commensurate at all. So this would be, for example, they are commensurate in how he sees things. I'm going to look at the text in a second because I think there's a fundamental conflation happening here. I don't think it's just nope. a matter of him seeing things. I think I think it's actually incoherent because, like, what you would do in this case oh, I'll, is say, I'll argue his point here. I, I know his point. I can argue it. All right. So the short version is uh, the U.S. puts out the laws says, here are the laws, here's what we're allowed to do, here's how things work. Vietnam specifically is an actually illegal war, has been from the beginning, we know not just because of Pentagon Papers, but how it was done, how we were doing it, uh, it's literally against the law for that war to be happening. So for citizens to take into their own hands to defend the law, it makes those acts legal by definition because they are in service of the law. Yeah, I don't like that line of argumentation because what's actually taking place is essentially a kind of complicated civil war because you're not you're not dealing with because the, the legal is is a framework 
that is established by power fundamentally. And I, I think I would be very surprised if Chomsky disagrees with this. And no, so, he does. and so, if you're, if you're, if if does he disagree with that? No. Okay. Yeah. So well, I mean, I mean, depending on what you mean by it, like there's well, a lot, what, that's a loaded fucking thing. Uh, yes. Well, what what I mean by it is essentially, um, the domain of the legal only only has an existence as such, and not just as, for instance, um, a series of propositions with no force. Uh, because it is enforced by by a power. Now, if the the enforcing power itself goes against that law, um, the normal situation in which the laws obtain for subjects may still maintain. Um, but when the citizens fight against the state in defense of that law's right to, uh, let's say, encompass the actions even of the enforcing power, um, it does so essentially as an assertion of its own power against an enemy power. It is not at that point actually an internal conflict. At that point, you were talking about um, one political entity vying for existential control against another distinct one that may be comprised of the same yes. people, but as corporations, they're separate. So again, Chomsky. So I'm just, like, just going to say as a big thing, Chomsky. And I actually think Foucault's about to make much of your point. But from Chomsky's position, we have rules. We tell everyone. Let's say we have a club. Yeah. And in that club, our rules are very simple. And uh, you're executed if you break the rules. I mean, just simple. Is it justified then to stop someone from breaking those rules, to, to eliminate that? And what does is, what is legal or illegal mean in that case? When we have the state, the state is pushing down a shit ton of laws on all of us. There's a lot of laws, a lot of them. And our job is to make sure that they're followed by our actions or others. I go about my day, I'm supposed to stay legal. That is my edict, I gotta stay legal. If I go outside of those bounds, I'm doing illegal things. But if I do something that is in service of ensuring legality is held up, I'm not doing illegal acts. So or, here's, here, here like I think would I... you say defending, and the example he uses of someone jaywalking uh, in order to tackle a machine gunner. Yeah. It, is that an illegal act, the jaywalking? Well, the problem is that... It, uh, is, it, is the assault illegal? Well, under under those conditions, like, you can easily skirt around that just by creating, like, a hierarchy of things where, like, uh, preventing a greater crime is in certain cases, like, uh, you can even write Correct. this into That's law. That's why we have gradations of laws. Right, but here's... here Here's what I think is kind of going on here. As a... This notion of protecting the law against its enforcer only really makes sense in a context in which... It's not protecting the law against its enforcer. It's the act is illegal or not based on its designation. Sure, but but if the designation itself is given force only because of who is supplying the designation and the one supplying the designation or, pro or providing the designation and enforcing it is also the thing that's in violation of it, then to assert the, the illegality of that act would, would seem to be kind of fictive because the, the notion of, the, of the, the legal has already been itself... Um, we've been sort of disillusioned about its its its. Well, depth, now you're right? getting into effectively the Foucault argument, or I think a lot of arguments, which would be, look, that's cute, but the real realities of law is here's who enforces them, here's how they're enforced, here's the systems that impede upon that, here's how it changes. Yeah. It's not even that things are really illegal; it's things are all fucking wild, and we have these weird ideas of laws, and the Constitution is even irrelevant. But the question of whether or not something's legal or illegal, from his perspective, and he's written a lot on this, and it's actually very interesting is very much about um, the act itself. In a, I don't want to say in a vacuum, but that's probably the best way to put it. To put it, is it against the law if it's for the law? If it is within the law? If it's it, that set up that he's got there, is it, I think it's fascinating. It's ultimately, he's, I don't think, necessarily arguing. Um, well, actually, he is generally arguing, but he, he's trying to put forward this idea that we be very careful about allowing ourselves to uh, say certain things are illegal when in reality and in how their in actions work and how they offer, operate, they're actually in service of the law more than more than those who would enforce the law uh, themselves are. Sure, but I think what I was going to get into is I think uh, Chomsky's notion of, of the legal then in this case sort of bears artifacts from a, a conception of... Uh, a conception of a, a state, say, as 
having some intrinsic separation of powers within it such that you can have guardians of the law against guardians of the law in that context that's sort of faded into the background and so the notion of sort of the monopolistic nature of sovereignty kind of gets lost in that because your conception of the state is is fundamentally pluralist in form even if you're you're like sort of on a surface level obviously denying it its pluralist nature and maybe insisting on like maybe moving to to a different to a more plural type of thing that seems to be kind of kind of implicit there um because otherwise like you you wouldn't say for instance like it, it would be a superfluous thing to say um is it is it legal to break the law towards some end you think is is good it's like well of course it's illegal the question is whether or not it being illegal is it should a force well and and this is where we get into like is it when we start talking about like uh, how we call things legal and illegal, which well, is I mean, here's 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 the arguments about even even if you don't want to go as far as to say it's like strictly illegal, at the very least, it moves into a domain in which it now needs to be uh, sort of baptized by a legal agency of some kind in order to make it legal, right? So, right, but I think this would this is ultimately what he's pushing for is that, um, and it's it's probably a place he would actually find some agreement with. I think Zizek and some of the other writers in that space where. Um, we have allowed this sort of nebulous language. And so by doing so, we've enabled people to do things that we call illegal or illegal or illegal or whatever they may be. And we're kind of loosey goosey with it, which allows the state to do those things. Whereas if we were very particular about uh, how the laws are enforced and we were aware, we force the state to change the laws. We force the state to state to say the things. It's one of the sort of long-standing, I mean, I would think this is a general revolutionary sort of uh, rhetoric is to always try to get those in power to admit that the emperor has no clothes or that they have to change the laws to sort of do these horrible things. As soon as we don't require that inside of the laws, then are things legal or illegal or does it even matter? And his thing is about making sure we're more careful on that. It's a point of his I've always liked, actually. I'll have to look into that further later traffic light to prevent somebody from, let's say, machine gunning a group of people, of course that's not a violation of law. It's an appropriate and proper action. No sane judge. It's also interesting on the subject of no sane judge, it's also the premise under the, the massive ramping up of the checkpoint system in Israel. Which would convict you for such an action. Similarly, a good deal of what the state authorities define as civil disobedience is not really civil disobedience. In fact, it's legal, in fact, obligatory behavior in violation of the commands of the state which may or may not be legal commands. So one has to be rather careful about, the, about calling things illegal. So you're right. Mais, alors là, je voudrais vous poser une question. Quand vous, aux états unis lorsque vous faites une action franchement illégale, which I regard as illegal, not just the state. No, the, the, uh, when the, the, the state, uh, an the action that the illegal. state considers as illegal. Yeah. Est-ce que vous faites cette action Parce que vous la trouvez juste yeah. en vertu d'une justice yeah. idéale, ou bien est-ce que vous la faites parce que yeah. la guerre de classe yes. la rend utile et nécessaire? Well, est-ce que vous vous référez à une justice idéale? Again, very often when I do something with... He seems very annoyed. Am I, am I misreading this? No. No, no, he's not. The state regards as illegal, I regard it as legal. Yes, that's because I regard the state. The, the edit there, there was uh, four or five sentences back and forth. So, brilliant. Probably, yeah. I don't Fine, they didn't say very much. In some instances, that's not true. That is, let me be quite concrete about it. Uh, what on earth is, okay, maybe you can help me with this. What on earth does it mean for the state to be criminal, though? Okay. Um, hey, how are you guys doing? I'm Ronald Reagan. Uh, treason is something we're going to try people for. I'm going to go sell arms uh, to these guys and use it to buy Coke and to those guys, uh, even though Congress told me I couldn't, even though explicitly I'm required by law to do so. So I'm going to commit high treason. And when I commit high treason, I give orders to soldiers to do these things. Question is, the commands of the state, which is the commands of soldiers do this, people do this, guys do this, is that a legal or an illegal act? Well, obviously, we can have debates about in effect whether it is what it is it's explicitly illegal uh the vietnam war explicitly illegal uh, iraq war afghanistan war oh like iraq war completely illegal like a lot of shit we've done we've done a lot of legal shit 
But the commands of the state, when the state gives that edict, we have, as Chomsky would say, we have a, uh, we have the commands of the state to do the legal action. I don't, I don't, I don't like this. I'll tell you why I don't like this, this framing to begin with. There's a reason why there isn't really a strong state tradition of theory in, in political science in the United mm -hmm. States. And that's precisely because the nature of the United States constitution is that the state doesn't actually do a whole lot, um, in, in terms of like individual action. Um, this would be an indiv the holder of an individual office doing a thing that is against the explicit, uh, writ of the law. Um, but there also, there also isn't uh, like he's, he's doing so fundamentally as a citizen charged with certain prerogatives, but he's doing so fundamentally as the first of citizens, not as the state itself. And the problem I'm having here is that he seems to be allowing, if I'm, if, if, if I'm, I'm reading you correctly, he seems to be allowing the illegal activities of people holding the executive decision to bleed over into the illegality of the state. And that seems to me to be a conflation of terms. I think we're passing over into something else then. Because the, the the legal is 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 as I understand it, like the 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 rules that comprise whether or not one is operating within the realm of the legal or the illegal, um, that's a thing that that's 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 essentially like a simulational thing that only really exists within the context of a state power sustaining it. But when we're talking about external to the state, when we say like an illegal war, sometimes we mean and uh, like an individual agency within government is prosecuting a war that's against the constitution of the state in some way. But frequently what we mean is that's against international law. There's sort of norms, norm, normative agreements that, that we, we sort of assume must obtain or else, uh, a, a normal situation of amicability and cooperation is in some sense disrupted with whatever consequences that entails. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, it's, it seems like there's sort of the ghost of the state operating above the state for Chomsky. Well, but there is a bit because um, for him, again, he isn't blind to the social realities of things. And I'm not, not to skip ahead too much, but uh. post Nuremberg, we absolutely have now a demand at an international level to not just follow orders. Like that is actually a thing that we've sort of stated because we fucking hung a lot of people who were just following orders. We tried a lot of people who were just following orders. We That became a real thing. Thing. True, like, but like, but only upon defeating the state in war, so that the state itself was effectively non-existent. We took people from a conquered power, and then we hung them. I'm not not disagreeing there. Yeah, but that still is the edict that was sort of given. Uh, the UN Charter, which he's going to bring up as well. These are very particular edicts that were given that we were signatories. Like there's there is an international sort of understanding of what's good or bad or or where war crimes begin and what we can and can't do. Um, and it's uh, the, well, the ability for us to have the conversation again in, in your version and in mine, cause I'm not wildly different again, I'm not arguing yeah, my yeah. position here. Um, um, law is a hilarious thing that we like to think is real. It's adorable. Um, as Chomsky conceives of it, it is quite effectively real and it, and it, interacts with us from an edict position and the commands it gives us in order to follow them. The question becomes, how do we follow them completely? And that's his, basically it's one of his anarchist critiques is when we start talking about laws, we're basically saying here are all the things we need to do to be a citizen of this area. But if for example, the United States is doing a huge illegal war in Vietnam, killing a lot of people completely illegally. Cambodia is a big, bad no, no that we did. That was insane and horrifying and absolutely war crimes across the board in every single capacity that there ever was is turning over a ammo train on its way to Vietnam. Is that an illegal act? That's what, that's his question. And I think it's an interesting question. I do yeah. think it's interesting. It's an interesting question. I, I yeah. Uh, Eagle Hagel, thanks for the $10. Maybe I'm a bit lost here. People commit crimes to prevent larger crimes all the time. There are plenty of such cases of punishing those who create these lesser crimes, though not without public outcry. We commit crimes, and thanks for the additional $10, we commit crimes every day that the state chooses not to enforce for a range of reasons, but this seems to mean that legality and its enforcement is squarely within the court and of those with power. Well, I think we would both agree with that, although like when you say... Um, is squarely in the court I, I don't of think, those and Chomsky power. wouldn't disagree with that. Well, that's he why that's why I'm that. that's why I'm perplexed because it seems like it seems like there's it's, there's a root inconsistency in Chomsky. 
it's it's a more nuanced thing than than just it, laws matter. It's him saying, uh, "I'm going to try to say it in like a silly, more extreme way." Hey, look, I'm an anarchist. Laws are for fucking dumb people. But if you're going to have them, how do you know which ones to follow? Do you follow all of them? Because the government doesn't care. So if you kill the guy who's going to shoot your wife illegally, if um, you know someone shoots a cop when that cop is gunning down people innocently, is who's who did the illegal act? Both of them? No. <laughs> like, like if you're going to be living with laws, this is what you've got to deal with. Like, where is the illegal act in that in that math? He's going to be getting into well, a little it, bit well, more. Well, that's, and- that's, that's tricky, though, because, like, for example, if somebody had interfered with George Floyd with the result of Derek Chauvin being killed, it would be talking about that incident very, very differently, and, and it would the, that person would not be exonerated on the grounds that he perceived uh, an innocent man being killed by someone who held a, a state badge, right? Correct. If one of the other cops had killed Derek Chauvin to Same stop thing, him yeah. from killing, yeah. Yeah, would it have been an illegal act? Like that's actually a de- that's actually the question to ask. Would that have been an illegal act? The answer is no, because it's a police acting in service, saving a life, blah blah. blah. He would have been fine. Dude, that is I, where he's talking about the line that's interesting. I think I think that is interesting, but I I, I think I think it's it seems to me obvious at least that it would be an illegal act. Um, the 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 cop who did so would be prosecuted very heavily, and and at no point would there be. Um, some kind of transformation of uh, Derek Chauvin's status into a criminal and this other person's status uh, away from the criminal to I, this person is... Entirely. Yeah. I, I, I think you're being very much... Uh, you're being a bit pedantic on that one okay. because this is not the point. Like, you're, you're talking about the effect of the thing. That's not Chomsky... He's not discussing the effect of the thing. He's asking... What do laws do? What is the law? What is legal and what is illegal? It's not a question of what in, what in effect is legal and illegal. It is when we have a law, we have a series of them. What is legal and illegal in those lanes? This is not an ethical discussion. This isn't a moral discussion. Oh, no, no. I, 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 I with justice. He's being to the letter talking about how linguistically we talk about the edicts of law. And so if we have laws where X, 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 all these things are legal. For example, um, it's illegal for the president to rape and murder. And so if Trump went down to fifth Avenue, and began doing that, right. Just doing that, just having fun. And he brought a bunch of soldiers with him, and he said, just start doing that. And they all started doing it. Is that a legal act or an illegal act? It's a, it's an illegal act that the state, even in its power structure is operating illegally. And anyone who responds by killing them is operating legally because they are doing so in the letter of the law. Yeah, but like what's happening here, though, in this particular case, even though when we're like, I understand we're we're talking about the law and not its not its effects and how we talk about the law. But by the same token, it seems like how we talk about the law sort of presumes once again this this optical surveillance backdrop where um, it, it's not simply the case that something is le- legal or illegal in fact based upon what is being done. It, it generally is actually. It. it is. Well, I, I don't know about that because, like, for example, and the reason why I was talking about the case of, of the cop who shot Derek Chauvin is that in that event, um, we would lack the knowledge of what Derek Chauvin was doing. And so all we would be left with is the cop killing uh, another cop. Absolutely. Uh, cops have interfered on other cops before. It, like, like sure. that, that in and of itself, like, again, you're not talking, we're not having the same discussion. You're talking about, well, what would we know? How would it be prosecuted? How would it come out? It's like, no, no. Well, not it's not, that's not, not exactly. That. It's not exactly what I'm saying, though. I'm not talking about how would it be prosecuted, how would it be, how would it come out. I'm talking about insofar as we're talking about the law as an existent thing. That is where it is to be found, right? Because it's not an existent thing. Not. This is not how Chomsky's talking about it. Okay. The law is written in books. You can go read them, and they are edicts of how you're supposed to behave. Their words very particular to that. Whether or not they're effective, or whether or not. They actually are enforced or how they're enforced and how they're unevenly enforced. All these things are true. And these are parts of his critique, but his underlying thing. And again, it's the part that I kind of like is this idea of when we say people are behaving illegally. So when we say uh, in his example, uh, but let's, let's go with another one. The campers at cop city, are they behaving illegally? Well, 
given that there was no democratic like atlanta requires a democratic vote for these things and these things were stepped outside of those bounds that there's a whole bunch of shit that sort of was glossed over there's illegal moves being made throughout this i think we could argue very easily that it's not necessarily illegal in fact we shouldn't be calling what they're doing illegal and that that use of language is actually deeply important when we talk about generalized revolutionary or protesting action uh black lives matter 100 percent, we could say if we were to be pedantic about it that all of that was an illegal act everything that happened with blm because you know gathering without permits is totally illegal and i don't think a lot of people got permits uh there were there was all kinds of people there was drug use and a lot of illegal but that that's not the point that's not the point for chomsky it's everyone was doing those things in service of the law as it's written as the sort of stapling of that law going up the illegal things the murders that are happening trying to stop further murders that's his argument All right, let's press on uh yeah yeah and move from the area of class war to imperialist war where the situation is somewhat clearer and easier take international law a very there you big go. instrument as we know but nevertheless it incorporates some rather interesting principles well international law in many respects is the instrument of the powerful that is international law permits much too wide a range of inter of international forceful intervention in support of existing power structures that define themselves as states and against the interests of masses of people who happen to be organized in opposition to states but in fact international law is not solely of that kind and in fact, there are interesting elements of international law, let's say embedded in the United Nations Charter, which permit, in fact, I believe, require the citizen to act against his own state in ways that the state will falsely regard as criminal. But nevertheless, he's acting legally because international law also happens to, pro to prohibit the threat or use of force in international affairs, except under some very narrow circumstances of which, for example, the war in Vietnam is not one which means that in the particular case of, let's say, the Vietnam War, the one that interests me most, the American state is acting in a criminal capacity, and people have the right to stop criminals from, from murdering people. Uh, just because the criminal happens to call, you a, to call your action illegal when you try to stop him, that doesn't mean it is illegal. I mean, a perfectly clear case of that is the present case of the Pentagon Papers in the United States, which I suppose you know about. Reduced to its essentials and forgetting legalisms, what is happening is that the state is trying to prosecute people for exposing its crimes. That's what it amounts to. So what, what's at issue here is there's competing theories of the state, and they're kind of critical because Chomsky has a weird view of law that, that seems to act as a kind of abstract morality adjacent. Um, but when we're talking about the 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 state as that which uh validates and gives and 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 enforces law or makes the writ like in the legal books law in in terms of its practical force like in terms of like an actual existent thing um we're talking about something that is is simultaneous to like it, it's legitimating force isn't thereby restricted by the fact of, of it having legitimated once. And simultaneously, given that it has a monopoly on legitimate physical force in, in, in its logic, or, or to move back from Bible, just given the fact that it is identified as such by it being unique in its capacity to enforce. Um, Again, it, it can also, not, it can also be... Discussion to, this is you are you and I, you and I would have this discussion, this would be fun, but this is not what no, Chomsky's not even advocating, I think, where you're talking. Let's step back a second. Let's say we could talk to the next 50 years of revolutionaries. One piece of advice I would give, and I think it's what Chomsky is saying here ultimately, is don't let them say what you're doing is illegal. That word, those words, that propaganda, that's how they, that's how they distance themselves from you. That's how they demand and they control you that the legalism within the power systems is actually how people are controlled. And if we can, and we should, turn it back on them, we can actually win a propaganda war in the long run. I believe this is accurate, actually. 
for different reasons, but I believe this is accurate. I don't think so because it robs you of the domain of legal of the legal entirely, which is something that you need because it's it's a no, it's not. It's a codification. It's a useless, useless. No, it's a codification. It's a codification of norms, so that in the in the absence of even even in the absence of an overarching state power structure, it means that at no point is is um, a decision being made on the basis solely. Um, of the prejudice of someone who happens to be in a position to to enforce their will at a given time, and that can be at any any level of analysis, from like e even even in like some like uh, conjectured communist society, like a, a mentor over someone who's in training for a particular task, right? Like you 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 would still need at some level when you're dealing with any kind of systematic relationship between people over a long duration of time. But but norms but here's have the thing. some persistence. I'm gonna. But here's. Let's take a thread. I'm going to I'm going to keep Steelman and Chomsky here because okay. I this is one of those things where I, I have different reasons to come to much of the same conclusion. Have you read Manufacturing Consent? No. OK, you should, by the way. It's, I, it's a pretty good read. It's on the list. Um, I, I was watching your thing at uh, Israel and Hamas and how uh, the news media likes to use the words killed and died in very particular ways. Do you think that matters? Uh, I. Yes. Yes. So why wouldn't the word legal and illegal matter in I think the same that, I way? Think that, I think they matter. I think they do matter in exactly the same way. But what I'm, what I'm seeing here isn't, isn't strictly relegated to that. And I agree with the sentence that you were saying. But what I'm seeing here is something a little bit different. I'm actually seeing an overt... I'm, I'm, I'm not seeing like a, a prescriptive statement saying, do not allow them to characterize this as the illegal because we have these other frames of reference that contradict it and so it's not authoritative and this is a way in which you are conned into accepting the crimes of just a slightly bigger fish within a larger hierarchical context. What I'm seeing is is a, a pretty, and, and maybe this is just because of like the, the stuff that's been cut, but what I'm seeing is, is a pretty bold conflation of the moral with the legal so that the legal, there's no there's no moral in there. It, well, there that, that's well, that, that's where in lies the conflation because the illegal becomes the legal on the basis of an independent judgment about what is in the service of of the no, law. No, it's what's the, it's what the higher laws are. But like very specifically, we have we have a codification. Every country does of laws. We it, littering is not high treason. They're not the same thing. They're not put in the same area. They're not part of the same thing. Punishments aren't the same. We. We literally have codified these as various levels. We have 10 different versions of people killing someone that can get you different. There's a there's layers to all of these that are literally hard coded in the I mean law. littering could be treason. No. Yeah. I mean, sure, but again, yeah. the question well, the, would the, be the, the the point that I'm getting at is like it, it it may be the case that we have sort of like a common sense notion that certain things are are of lower priority than others, and therefore the lower priority of things um, can be can be excused in the service of not violating the higher priority of things. But the the thing which determines that hierarchy of prioritization, I would argue, is itself equivalent in in nature and and importance to each of those priorities themselves. It is itself self same with that whole structure, and so the notion of a hierarchy itself in this sense is still parasitic. On that hierarchy that is imposed by a specific state power, and so it seems to me that there's a bit of a contradiction here because he's 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 using that same source to contradict its source. Does that make sense? Yes, um, I don't think it necessarily defeats his point, at least not in a way that I'm necessarily convinced of. I do look again. This ain't uh, me. Yeah, and yeah, my yeah. my my core critique of manufacturing consent i come at it from a very different place my core critique here is um that uh, narratives are driven by power structures and how we get involved in them and so to your point about littering being able to be called high treason we can find a way to write the story that makes anything anything we we literally can do whatever the fuck we want yeah. telling a story to convince someone of a crime even if they didn't do the thing exactly as well sodomy law, loss, the story. right like arguably less harmful than littering um, same sex relations, right? I mean, we, 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 we rank those though, historically, um, much greater in severity than dropping a Coke can on the ground. So, 
Tully Critter, I'm not, I'm not saying I agree with Chomsky. I'm saying I come yeah. to the same point as Chomsky, specifically on the idea of how we use language and what language you use allows people to invest themselves in different ways. If we say that the illegal protesters, if that's a phrase we use for Cop City versus saying the illegal police, like yeah. there's words we use that matter and that's manufacturing consent and it's really probably Chomsky's only really great book. Um, I mean, it's, I think it's a solid, it's a solid read. It's about specifically how this happens and how we get ordered into war and taken into war. And it's, it was a horrifying thing for me to read as the Iraq, the set, the second Iraq war was happening because it was written to, right before the first Iraq war. So like to actually read it and know that it's just the way shit works. It was wild. Um, but it's, it's. That's the part I agree with, but it, again, it's only the actions. He's. We'll see where they go. We'll see because I don't want to jump too much ahead because I don't know exactly what's in the video. Mm -hmm. But Foucault has some lovely responses. There's only 18 minutes left, so not not a tremendous amount. I I would like to return at some point to like I'm I want to go through the debate, off screen and maybe like find some selections that I might go over later. But there's some great points. There's some great stuff when they when they really go back and forth. It's nailing it. C'est donc au oh nom d'une justice plus pure que vous critiquez le fonctionnement de la justice parce que euh, pour moi si vous voulez important de savoir ça parce que nous avons actuellement en France un débat sur le problème de la justice et à propos de l'institution d'un tribunal populaire à propos de la justice vous connaissez le problème de ce... et un certain nombre de gens comme Sartre, par exemple, pense que pour faire actuellement la critique du système pénal en France ou pour faire la critique <laughs> de la, euh, des pratiques policières... De la Why would you zoom in on that guy? Oh, faire... it, they've done it multiple times, too. It's just... <laughs> Hang on. Et un certain nombre de gens, euh, comme Sartre, par exemple, I can only think his bifocals got backwards put in. So he's got a... Uh, maybe. No, he's looking up. And he's asleep. <laughs> I'm, I'm sympathetic with him. <laughs> yes, it looks like he's having the same argument we just had. More or less qui au nom d'une justice idéale, d'une justice supérieure, What are they justice drinking? It's yellow. en général, condamnera la pratique des juges français ou des policiers français. Et puis il y a un autre groupe de gens, et je me sens, enfin je, je travaille avec ces gens-là, qui disent non, il ne faut pas faire cela parce que quand vous vous référez à la justice idéale, que le tribunal serait censé appliquer, vous vous référez en fait à un certain nombre d'idées de justice qui ont été formées à notre époque par un certain groupe d'individus euh, qui sont eux-mêmes, malgré tout, d'une façon directe ou indirecte, les produits de la société dans laquelle nous nous trouvons. Il faut attaquer les pratiques de la justice, il faut attaquer la police, Il faut attaquer les pratiques policières, mais en termes de guerre et non pas en termes de justice. But you see, surely you believe that your role in the war is a just role, that you're fighting a just war to bring in a concept from another domain. And that, I think, has to is is important. If you thought that you were fighting, I'm with I'm with go here. Like it's hard. Hang on, hang on. Off, wait, this wait, goes wait. off the rails. I need, I need to hear this again. Uh, he says he starts saying real dumb shit here. Il faut attaquer les pratiques de la justice, il faut attaquer la police, il faut attaquer les pratiques policières, mais en termes de guerre et non pas en termes de justice. But you see, surely you believe that your role in the war is a just role. But this is the conflation of, of, of morality with legality that I was talking about. I know, about I know. So I win. I, I would... Yes, you do. I'll, yes. You know what? I'm going to give it to you because I'm. You're, you're making my point anyway. You make the actual point. I believe. There you go. Yes, you are eternally correct on that specific one. But it, it's again, 
I guess we can just finish it here then. Yeah. I'm sorry, go on. And how it operates, I do like the argument because it's an in, one, it's an interesting thought experiment, but two, yeah. the way we use language is deeply important. And that's the thing, Chomsky, if there is a thing he brought to political discourse, uh, it is manufacturing consent you should do a stream on or a read on. It's it's genuinely really good. I'll, I'll, um, I will I will seriously consider that in the near future. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, keep like, going because it, it, Chomsky it, says if if I think Chomsky says some really dumb shit very soon here. Well, good. We've been we've got 15 minutes, so we better at some point. That you're fighting a just war to bring in a concept from another domain, and that I think has to is is important. If you thought that you were fighting an unjust war, you couldn't follow that line of reasoning. You see, this is this is why that analogy of like a just war is is like stupendous here because that's precisely what Aquinas is doing. He infers a higher law to justify the actions of, of agents in the world. That that's precisely what he's doing. Um and, and there is precisely that conflation between morality and law because it is downstream from um he doesn't use the language of morality of course, but it's it's like justice is downstream from the character or the law of of god at some level of analysis or the divine law which is an emanation from that um well, and it's, and it's fascinating to me because the idea that he's saying this he was very involved in anti-vietnam work like yeah. he was very active vietnam is is uh because we actually have tapes and recordings and we have like transcripts and we have uh, testimonies from soldiers we know they didn't fucking believe it was a just war they didn't give it like there that is not Every, every American soldier in Vietnam walking in there going, yeah, I'm here because I had good old, like, no, no, we 100% know that's not the case. And we knew it then. So it's, it's an asinine thing for him to say. Well, I think he's kind of accusing, he's accusing Foucault, I think incorrectly, of the same conflation that I was accusing Chomsky. And I think which Foucault was accusing Chomsky, but in more delicate terms, namely that um, what would drive Foucault to want to criticize the police in terms of power would be some other thing that isn't simply power itself. But I don't think Foucault would concede that for a second. Um, it would, oh, no, it, but it would Foucault's be, line here is yeah. really... You, do we want to just read and go on? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, sure. I want um, Foucault has this amazing line. Um, you said you wouldn't... If you didn't consider the war you make against the police to be just, you wouldn't make it. I would like to reply to you in terms of Spinoza. Mm -mm. and say that the proletariat doesn't wage war against the ruling class because it considers such a war to be just. The proletariat makes war with the ruling class because, for the first time in history, it wants to take power and because it will overthrow the power of the ruling class. It considers such a war to be just. Yeah, I don't agree, Chomsky said. He goes, one makes war to win. This is Foucault's response. It's amazing. One makes war to win, not because it is just. I don't personally agree with that. Ah. For example, if I could convince myself that attainment of power by the proletariat would lead to a terrorist police state in which freedom and dignity and decent human relations would be destroyed, then I wouldn't want the proletariat to take power. In fact, the only reason for wanting any such thing, I believe, is because one thinks rightly or wrongly that some fundamental human values will be achieved by that transfer of power. When so, the proletariat takes power, it may be quite possible that the proletariat will exert towards the classes over which it has just triumphed, a violent, dictatorial, and even bloody power. I can't see what objection one can make to this. But if you ask me what would be the case if the proletariat exerted bloody, tyrannical, and unjust power towards itself, then right. I would say that this could only occur if the proletariat hadn't really taken power, but that a class outside the proletariat, a group of people inside the proletariat, a bureaucracy, or petite bourgeois elements had taken power. He's so good at this. So this isn't, by the way, just for anybody who's finding this language He's like confusing. a debate bro. This That's isn't... Shit. This isn't... Yeah, this isn't... Um, like the immediate uh, example that comes to mind, of course, would be the uh, Bolshevik uh, Revolution, where you quite literally have a, a bureaucracy claiming to represent the proletariat that is actually exerting itself against it and is instituting precisely that kind of bloody tyrannical regime so, ag against the, the, the people it pretends to, to be an agent of. And so that's what he's talking about. And so in the event that the proletariat exerted bloody tyrannical and unjust power towards the proletariat or towards the people, at that point, in order to continue calling it the proletariat, you'd be uh, refusing to acknowledge that an actual fact was taken place. Is sort of an intrinsic separation that's required for that sentence, for that description to make sense. Namely, there is a thing which is exerting power over something else. These can't be identical with each other. Um, 
so uh, like because otherwise it would be it would be authoring uh, not its own tyranny but its own freedom because it would be it would be choosing for itself what what it did as an entity it wouldn't be the proletariat being subject to a law that was in some sense alienated from itself this would be this would be the the general will in its purest Rousseauian sense um, yeah this is this is good stuff it's really good. well what I like about this is even even though I disagree with him a lot like he's wrong in interesting ways. Like at the very least, well, like you can you can Chomsky, have fun with it. Chomsky at no point would I ever say is wrong because he's stupid. Like it's not that it's. Yeah. I have fundamental disagreements at like an, a base level of how things work that causes us to go in different directions. But he argues his points with his points. He believes in them. He's articulate. He cares about it. He's learned. He's studied. He's in a different direction than me. But he's he's very. Yeah. Plus, we end up in a lot of the same places. To be perfectly frank, a lot of the stuff he says, it's like, yeah, I get that. Uh, leaving leaving this sort of ameliorative point by Foucault aside, I think there's sort of a chicken and egg thing going on here because um, essentially what what Chomsky is saying is like, uh, yeah, you may uh, you you may fight for control of the state or you may fight a war to win. One, you may make war to win, um, but in addition, you you win something. You're 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 making you're 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 making war to win for something. It's not the end of the sentence because um, you don't simply make war to win. Um, you you want to win f for reasons. Um, even winning a war is extremely costly. Like you can do a whole lot of other stuff with your time and resources than than making war. There has to be like some agitating factor, and that can be like a sense of injustice. It can be like it can be greed or whatever, whatever. But there's going to be some other external measure. And I think where they're talking past each other is that Foucault stops at the refutation of the fact that there is um, some objective external measure sort of characterizing what happens beneath it. But he doesn't, he's not supplying though in a very clear sense um, how a, a power structure that is at a similar altitude, shall we say, as, um, as, as the, 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 decision to go to war and so on and so forth as as uh like the one makes war to win thing. he doesn't really uh clearly respond and say like this also provides the motive force too um you don't require like higher order things these can be these can be um related dynamics at, at a similar stratum i guess if that made any sense that was a really conflict way to say that no i i I'm, i followed okay and the only, see, I would like to slightly reformulate what you said. It doesn't seem to me that the difference is between legality and ideal justice. Oh, I need to. It's rather between legality and better <clears throat> justice. There you go. Now, this better system may have its defects, certainly will. But comparing the better system with the existing system uh, and not being confused into thinking that our better system is the ideal system, we can then argue, I think, as follows that the concept of legality and the concept of justice are not identical. They're not entirely distinct either. Uh, insofar as legality incorporates justice in this notion, in this sense of better justice, referring to a better society, then... So I, th I think this actually kind of encapsulates the fundamental distinction. So I would, and I think Foucault would say this. Oh, yeah. I would say, well, look, I would like say we that were the... Saying, he's, very, he's very honest and he's yeah. very articulate about what he's trying to say. Well, I think I think like I think he's got it completely backwards. I don't know if he's going about to like reflect this sentence and, and say the reverse as well. But if he's implying that um, the law incorporates justice, I think it's kind of the reverse. I think our notion of justice incorporates uh, artifacts from a notion of law, which is why we tend to uh, talk about. I, I I think I think his his argument is that they're they're distinct enough, but that they incorporate each other. Okay, we'll see. We're just, then we should follow and obey the law and force the state to obey the law and force the great corporations to obey the law and force the police to obey the law if we have the power to do so of course <laughs> now, if, but now in just final if in those areas where the legal system happens to represent not better justice but rather the techniques of oppression that have been codified in a particular autocratic system well then a reasonable human being should disregard and oppose them, at least in principle. He may not, for some reason, do it in fact. Yeah, he, he doesn't. He doesn't reflect that backwards. Like he doesn't. He doesn't say that the the moral takes on aspects of the legal. He simply says legal takes on aspects of the moral, and he treats the moral 
almost as if it has like a quasi or the just rather like just as it has like a quasi divine status it's just kind of there i think that's that's the I, I, like again like there's there's sentences missing so it's 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 difficult to say i don't want to be unfair simplement répondre à votre toute première phrase quand vous avez dit mais uh, la guerre que vous faites contre la police si vous ne considériez pas there we go got spinoza here vous ne la feriez pas yeah, this, Alors, is the, this is the one I was saying. It's such a great Spinoza, Je vous dirai, le prolétariat ne fait pas la guerre à la classe dirigeante parce qu'il considère que cette guerre est juste. Le prolétariat fait la guerre à la classe dirigeante parce qu'il veut, pour la première fois dans l'histoire, prendre le pouvoir. Et c'est parce qu'il veut prendre le pouvoir qu'il considère que sa guerre est juste. Yeah, I don't agree. On fait la guerre pour gagner et pas parce qu'elle est juste. I don't personally agree with that. For example, if I could convince myself that attainment of power by the proletariat would lead to a terroristic police state in which uh, freedom and uh, dignity and decent human relations would be destroyed, then I wouldn't want the proletariat to take power. In fact, the only reason for wanting any such thing, I believe, is because one thinks rightly or wrongly, that some fundamental human values will be achieved by that transfer of power. Alors, je vous répondrai ceci. It's the rightly or wrongly thing that's the Achilles heel he keeps showing over yeah. and over. Like, it's like literally the, the problem then of the thing he's saying. He, he, he can't get out of that box for some reason. Well, I mean, this is Chomsky. Yeah, but that's interesting, though, because as you say, like, Trump, he's clearly, like, a, a ferociously intelligent person. This is not beyond him. So I'm curious as to what keeps him locked in at that level. Like, there's there's a conceptual block here well, that's he's a actually... Fucking, he's a linguist in the, like, tradition of, like, Brussels. Like, he's... He's... Do you think just... Do you think his... He's in a particular philosophical thinking tradition. He happens to be, I think, quite left. I I do believe he is. And, again... He ends up in a lot of the same places that I do, and it's kind of fun to see that he shows up there, despite taking very different roads. Il se peut bien que le prolétariat euh, exerce à l'égard des classes dont il vient de triompher, il exerce un pouvoir violent, dictatorial et même sanglant. Je ne vois pas quelle objection on peut faire à cela. Maintenant, vous me direz, vous me direz. Et si le prolétariat exerce ce pouvoir sanglant, tyrannique et injuste à l'égard de lui-même, le prolétariat Alors je vous répondrai, ça ne peut se produire que si le prolétariat n'a pas réellement pris le pouvoir, mais c'est que une classe extérieure au prolétariat ou un groupe de gens intérieurs au prolétariat, une bureaucratie ou les restes de la petite bourgeoisie, etc., s'est emparé du pouvoir. Well, I'm not at all satisfied with that theory of revolution for a lot of reasons, historical and other. It's not a theory of revolution. But even if one were to accept it for the sake of argument, still that theory uh, is holding that, is maintaining that it is proper for the proletariat to take power and exercise it in a violent and bloody and unjust fashion because it is claimed, in my opinion falsely, that that will be, that that will no. be. To a more just society. No, no, no. The, the Foucault's entire point is is that there isn't like a higher order justice. It's modeling its decision to go to war on. It's that it's the interest which is intrinsic and internal to it is what motivates the need to go to war. And then downstream from that, it classifies that as just on that basis. Yep. And okay. they may or may not be mistaken. <sighs> like that works for... Foucault's argument. That's yeah, it does. Argument. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, because they can they can misread their interest or, or something like that. I don't know. Like, like there can be like a contradiction between what they perceive as their interest and and the action they take to get to it. Like you can you can make they can make unwise decisions. Is how I would read that. Um, yeah, I, I don't. Know. In which the state will wither away, in which the proletariat will be a universal class, and so on and so forth. If it weren't for that further justification, the Concept, the concept of okay. a dictatorship of the proletariat, violent and bloody, would certainly be unjust. At least, I, I, for example, am not a committed pacifist. That is, I don't 
say, I would not hold that it is under... No, 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 he, he, he's mixed up the analogy because he's, he's presumed that the, the violence would still be against the proletariat in these cases. But a dictatorship by the proletariat would be a dictatorship by the proletariat over and against other classes. It wouldn't be a dictatorship over itself. This is why the dictatorship of the proletariat isn't communism. The dictatorship of the proletariat still presumes class distinctions. It's not a dictatorship by a, a vanguard representation of the proletariat. That's the Bolshevik. Uh, that's we should Bolshevik read some party. of the some of the stuff that's been left out of here that he's saying. I think again, it's it's not as simple a response. Yeah, yeah. Uh, wh where um, are we? Like what page? Do you know? I mean, fucking, it's jumped. It's jumped back and forth in time at this point. Okay. Um, I'm I'm just going a little bit further where he says uh, uh, the idea is. Oh, here we go. It's right here. I got it. I'm where 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 are you? Uh, I'm on page fifty-two. Yeah. Well, I'm not all satisfied with that theory. Um. And then he's on the bottom right. I'm committed pacifist. Use of violence, creation of degree of injustice can be justified on the basis of the claim of the assessment. Um, and it's this is where Foucault. Yeah, it's back and forth. Let's see what they let's see what they left in. All imaginable circumstances wrong to use violence, even though use of violence is in some sense unjust. I believe that one has to estimate relative injustices. But the use of violence and the creation of some degree of injustice can only itself be justified on the basis of the claim and the assessment, which always ought to be undertaken very, very seriously and with a good deal of skepticism, that this violence is being exercised because a more just result is going to be achieved. Hang on. So, even yeah, though use of violence is in not, some sense he's unjust. Not, just real quick, just pull yeah, back. Yeah. He's already made the explicit thing, and it's I think it's because he misstated earlier, this isn't about an idealized form of justice. It's yeah. the furtherance of justice. It's more just. And that's a judgment call, as he said, and again, the failure. So go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Uh, if it does not have that grounding, it really is totally immoral, in my opinion. Je ne suis pas, je, je ne pense pas que l'idéal de la guerre de classe, enfin le but que se propose le prolétariat en menant la guerre de classe, je ne crois pas qu'on puisse dire, enfin qu'il soit suffisant de dire que c'est une plus grande justice. Ce que le prolétariat veut faire en chassant la classe actuellement au pouvoir et en prenant pour lui le pouvoir, c'est la suppression, précisément, d'un pouvoir de classe en général. Okay. Car le prolétariat... Non, 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 c'est le mistake qu'il fait. Donc, il est en train de la suppression de la classe power comme un acte de violence. Um, sorry, as, as the justification for an act of violence and not synonymous with the dictatorship of the proletariat because the proletariat's identity is predicated upon it being dominated by another class. And so the move is to reverse that so that the only class that is, 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 has any longevity is the proletariat so that eventually that is what you've got. And so you have the elimination of class distinctions altogether. And so it's not a perpetual situation in which, uh, you have you have like a weird uh ghettoization of the rich or something um it's 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 the 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 act of the dictatorship of the proletariat is itself the squeezing out in time with with the conclusion at some point of of class distinctions categorically because it is it is an act of violence that is stripping certain parties of the things which give them coercive power over the proletariat as a whole that's that's the move I think that Foucault is making. Chomsky is interpreting this as a constitution in which people of certain classes retain their class distinction, but are then oppressed by a different class, and so you have like a a switching up of the roles into perpetuity. Like that is true. Like it is a switching up of the roles as, as like a transitory phase. I think is the argument. What do you what do you think? I think they're about to have a back and forth that I want to get to, sorry. <sighs> Further justification. Ça, ça, the, justification oh, yeah, but wait. Oh, but it is pouvoir. in terms of justice. It's because the end that will be achieved, it is claimed, is a just end. If the no 
you know, Leninist or whatever you like, would dare to say we have a right to take power, let's say we the proletariat, uh, and then throw everyone else into crematoria, let's say. I mean, if that were the consequence of the proletariat taking power, of course it would not be appropriate. The idea is, and the, as for reasons I mentioned, I'm skeptical about it, that uh, a period of violent dictatorship, of perhaps violent and bloody dictatorship, is justified because that will mean the submergence and termination of class, of class oppression, mm -hmm. a, a, a proper end to achieve in human life. Mais il me semble que de toute façon, uh, la notion même de justice... He, he got the point, but then he still insisted on sort of a justice that hovers over it that isn't coming from within the class interest itself. Uh, just to finish his sentence there that they yeah, cut. Yeah. Oh, God, okay. Um, it will mean the submergence and termination of class oppression, a proper end to achieve in human life. It is because of that final qualification that the whole enterprise might be just oh. Whether or not it is, is another issue. They just fucking slandered these guys in this. I mean, that's like that's, a very that's, reasonable, that's, interesting stance. Oh, I, I agree with that stance. That's the correction that I just made. Like, Yes, it is. I thought I'd just like to let you know. I mean, I agree with Foucault's response to it, but that's an important little thing here. Like, cutting two sentences is amazing what it does, right? Uh, the video is only an hour long. Why did they cut so much? What was the point? I guess well, they needed that TV. jackass to be in there and going... Oh, yeah, no, it's not even, it's not even like, an hour, because they, they added, like, additional stuff that just... Hello, I'll speak my silly Central European language for a little while that isn't quite French and isn't quite Swedish, but instead a mishmash of all of that, plus Germany. Ha, 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 ha. Sorry, I mean to my all my friends in the Netherlands and Denmark. I make fun of their accents too. I'm, I'm so mad about this. Ah. Oh. You know, it really would have been nice to like watch a debate between Foucault and Chomsky tonight instead of whatever this is. Wait, what is? What? Wait, well, they, what's they, his response? What did they skip? Did they skip his good point? They did. Wait, go back. I want to. I want to hear what. A okay, period of violent yeah. dictatorship or bloody dictatorship. Perhaps violent and bloody dictatorship is justified because that will mean the submergence and termination of class of class oppression, mm -hmm. a, a, a proper end to achieve in human life. But it seems to me, and what do we have here? Okay, well, that's really far along. If you like, I will like I will be a little bit Nietzschean about this. In other words, it seems to me that the idea of justice in itself is an idea which, in effect has been invented and put to work in different types oh, oh, of societies. Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on, wait, 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 no, no, it, it didn't, it didn't cut it. it, it reordered the sentence, so hang on, and he might actually have it, because no. he's, because when he says, uh, it, it seems to me that comes after the Nietzschean thing, so I think what he'll do is, it's going to say, it seems to me, and I might be a little bit Nietzschean about it, so let's see if he does that. No. Wait, believe. Have faith, fuck, okay, you're right, fine. <laughs> God damn it. All right, I guess you were. No, it doesn't matter anymore. It's just, it's really tough when this happens, man. It's frustrating. La société de classe, comme revendication du côté de la classe opprimée et comme justification du côté de la classe oppressée. <laughs> I don't agree with that. Et, uh, uh, dans une, dans une société... Okay, so this is the actual sentence. If you like, I'll be a little Nietzschean about this. Uh, in other words, it seems to me that the idea of justice in itself is an idea which in effect has been invented and put to work in different types of societies as an instrument of a certain political and economic power or as a weapon against that power. But it seems to me that in any case, the notion of justice itself functions within a society of classes as a claim made by the oppressed class as a justification for it. He didn't like an amazing, he didn't it's an say, amazing paragraph. It's, it it's amazing. is. It would have been great if, if they let him say it in this clip. I don't know what this is. Uh, is this... Well, and, and Chomsky here goes on his back foot because it's, it's, it's a thing he disagrees with because he has to for other reasons. But his response is kind of more freeform than I think. Um, because Foucault here says, in a class of society, I'm not sure we would still use this notion of justice, which is very nice. And Chom it, let's just see what Chomsky says back, because if it doesn't start with, well, here, I really disagree. I think there's an absolute basis. Well, I think he already said that. It was just, it was, he was interrupted. Here, let's go back here. No, 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 no. 
Well, I really just... Ah, whatever. I don't agree with that. Yeah, oh, I see. Next one. I, well, here I really here we disagree. I think that uh, there is a sort of an absolute basis. Uh, if you press me too hard, I'll be in trouble because I can't sketch it out. But some sort of an absolute basis ultimately residing in fundamental human qualities in terms of which a real notion of justice is grounded. And I think that our existing systems of justice... Oh, I don't like that. Oh, no, you wouldn't. It's too hasty this... to characterize our existing systems of justice as merely systems of class oppression. I don't think that they are that. I think that, they're, that they embody systems of class oppression, and they embody elements of other kinds of oppression, but they also embody a kind of a groping towards the uh, true human, humanly valuable concept of... He, it's clear he's grasping, because he doesn't even believe the literal words he's saying. You can Like when he goes, like when he does that, it's like, okay, he's... He's trying to gesture at, again, the structures that he believes are innate to humanity and the nature of their existence, which is the human nature. Like, this brings it full fucking circle to the entirety of the debate, which is kind of amazing. I, I don't know if he doesn't believe it. I think it just might be, like... No, no, he doesn't believe the words he's saying, that, like, the idea of, like, a true idealized... That's not the way he talks about things. Sure. Like, it, it rewinds slightly, just do 10 seconds, just an arrow bump back, and you'll see him go, ah. Can't, I think it's too hasty to characterize our existing systems of justice as merely systems of class oppression. I don't think that they are that. I think that, they're, that they embody systems of class oppression, and they embody elements of other kinds of oppression, but they also embody a kind of a groping towards the uh, true human, humanly valuable concept of justice and decency and love and kindness and sympathy and so on which i think are real bon, que du temps pour, uh, okay what does he say after real and i think that in any future society which will of course never be a perfect society we'll have such concepts again which we hope will come closer to incorporating a defense of fundamental human needs including such needs as those for solidarity sympathy and whatever but will probably still reflect in some manner the iniquities and the elements of oppression of the existing society. However, I think what you're describing only holds for a very different kind of situation. For example, let's take the case of a national conflict. Here are two societies, each trying to destroy each other. That's timely. No question of justice arises. The only question that arises is, which side are you on? Are you going to defend your own society and destroy the other? I mean, in a certain sense, abstracting away from a lot of historical problems, that's what faced the soldiers who were massacring each other in the trenches in the First World War. They were fighting for nothing. What about the justice point earlier? Uh, they were fighting for nothing. They were fighting for the right to destroy each other. And in that kind of circumstance, no questions of justice arise. And of course, there were rational people, most of them in jail, like Karl Lipnick, for example, who pointed out that and, uh, the, who pointed that out and were in jail because they did so, or Bertrand Russell, to take another example, on the other side. There were people who understood that there was no point to that mutual massacre in terms of any sort of justice, and that they ought to just call it off. Now, those people were regarded as madmen or lunatics and criminals or whatever. But, of course, they were the only sane people around. In such a circ That feels like a thing Foucault would agree with. Yeah. And in such a circumstance, the kind that you describe where there is no question of justice, just the question of who's going to win in a struggle to the death, then I think the proper human reaction is, call it off. Don't win either way. Try to stop it. And of course, if you say that, you'll immediately be thrown in jail or killed or something of that sort, the fate of a lot of rational people. But I don't think that's the typical situation in human affairs, and I don't think that's the situation in the case of class conflict or social revolution. There, I think one can and must give an argument if you can't give an argument, you should extract yourself from the struggle. Give an argument that the social revolution that you're trying to achieve is the ends of justice. Is in the ends is, of justice, yeah. Is in the ends of justice, is in the ends of realizing fundamental human needs, not merely in the ends of putting some other group into power because they want it. Yeah, so they, they cut out the part that makes his sentence not stupid, which I resent a lot. 
It makes it it makes it really stupid because his response is like it starts. You can tell he's on a back foot because yeah. again he he believes in the idea of like a human. Well, the, the even like they, they put they put the real in quotes here, which which I like, um, because it, he seems hesitant in the clip, but in this version, it, it's kind of like made very clear that by real he doesn't mean like like prefiguring in in, in some sense. Correct. Um, any any he means affecting, of a, effective, re, real. It's out there. Uh, well, yeah, but not even that. Like when he says fundamental human qualities. He's he's not necessarily defaulting um, to an idea that uh, human notions of justice aren't intrinsically conditioned by the same notions of power to which Foucault will refer. Um, the problem is he doesn't make that explicit, and so he thinks he's arguing against Foucault when in fact he's he's sort of mislabeled things a little bit. Um, but I think they're they're consistent. But I think it's also like I, I think it's also kind of on Foucault from what I've read here, and we haven't read very much of it. Um, he he didn't make that element particularly clear, unless I'm misunderstanding Foucault. Uh, they skipped that entire section straight away. <laughs> Non, mais euh, bon, je ne veux pas répondre dans, en, en si peu de temps. Je dirais simplement ceci. Je ne peux pas m'empêcher, contrairement à ce que vous pensez, je ne peux pas m'empêcher de croire que cette notion de nature humaine, cette notion de bonté, de justice, d'essence humaine, de réalisation de l'essence humaine, tout ça, ce sont des notions et des concepts qui ont été formés à l'intérieur de notre civilisation Sunday, dans the video. notre type. Oh, shit. Sorry. Hang on. Let me go back. God damn it. Okay. And they're not missing a lot. Well, they missed everything, so... <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not the people who spoke French. I don't think my audience is filled with French speakers. Good language to learn. Absolutely. <laughs> Non, mais euh, bon, je ne veux pas répondre dans, en, en si peu de temps. Je dirais simplement ceci. Je ne peux pas m'empêcher, contrairement à ce que vous pensez, je ne peux pas m'empêcher de croire que cette notion de nature humaine, cette notion de bonté, de justice, d'essence humaine, de réalisation de l'essence humaine, tout ça, ce sont des notions et des concepts qui ont été formés à l'intérieur de notre civilisation, dans notre type de savoir dans notre forme de philosophie et que par conséquent ça fait partie même de notre système de classe et qu'on ne peut pas aussi regrettable que ce soit on ne peut pas faire valoir ces notions pour décrire ou justifier un combat qui devrait qui doit en principe bouleverser les fondements même de notre société il y a là une extrapolation dont je n'arrive pas à trouver la justification historique. Well, um, I think we can start immediately the discussion. And, uh... Mr. Chomsky, I would ask you one question. Uh, in your discussion, you uh, had the vocabulary of proletariat. We, as proletarian, yeah. it's the, the ir irony of history that at the moment, young intellectuals coming from middle class and upper class call themselves proletarians and say we must uh, join the proletarians mm. but I don't see any right. class uh, conscious proletarians that's a great okay. dilemma uh, it is not true in our uh, given society that all people are doing useful productive work like me self-satisfying work obviously it's very far from true those people lots of people who are excluded from uh, the possibility of productive labor. And I think the, revo the revolution, if you want, should be in the name of all human beings. But it will be, have to be conducted by certain categories of human beings, and those will be, the, I think, the human beings who really are involved in the productive work of society. Now, what that is will differ depending on the society. In our society, it, I think, includes intellectual workers. 
so I think that the student revolutionaries, if you like, have a, they have a point, a partial point. That is, it's a very important thing in a, mar in a modern, advanced industrial society. It's very important how the trained intelligentsia identify themselves, uh, if they're going to be technocrats, let's say, or servants of either the state or private power, or alternatively, whether they're going to identify themselves as part of the workforce, who happen to be doing intellectual labor. If the latter, then they play a, they can and should play a decent role in a progressive social revolution. If the former, then they're part of the class of the oppressors. They just skipped the good stuff again. He also pronounced intelligentsia, intelligentsia, which I thought was funny. Uh. I have an additional, uh, one small additional question. He has like, Mark, he's got you. like seriously like four, three pages on his response here that just like fucking is just taken out completely. Unbelievable. Who published this? Uh. See, it says excerpts from the debate. It's like, yeah, good job. Special thanks, anarchist group. Is it their fault? No, that's, that's <laughs> not the people who did it. That is that you wish you were a very courageous attitude towards the war in Vietnam. How can you survive in an institution like MIT, which is known here as one of the great war contractors and intellectual uh, makers of this war? Uh, there are two aspects to that. One is the a violent how beard. I'm, how MIT tolerates me, and the other question is how I tolerate MIT. Well, as to how MIT tolerates me, uh, here again, I think one shouldn't be overly schematic. Uh, it's true that MIT is a major With the Isaac Asimov look. war research, mm -hmm. but it's also true that it embodies very important libertarian values, which are, I think, quite deeply embedded in American society, fortunately for the world. They're not deeply embedded enough to save the Vietnamese, but they're deeply enough embedded to prevent far worse, worse disasters. And here I think one has to be a bit qualified. That is, there is imperial terror and aggression, there is exploitation, there is racism, lots of things like that. But there's also uh, a real concern coexisting with it for individual rights of a sort which, for example, are embodied in the Bill of Rights, which is by no means simply an expression of class oppression. It is also an expression of the necessity to defend the, in, the individual against state power. Now, these things coexist. Yeah, know? sure, but how is the individual defined? There, there you go. It's not that simple. It's not just all bad or all good. And uh, it's because it's the particular balance in which they coexist that makes it uh, that makes an institute that produces weapons of war be willing to tolerate, uh, in fact, you know, in many ways, even courage, to be quite honest, uh, a person who's involved in civil disobedience against the war. Now, as to how I tolerate MIT, that raises another question. There are people who argue, and I've never understood the logic of this, that a radical ought to dissociate himself from all oppressive institutions. That is, the logic of that argument is that Karl Marx shouldn't have studied in the British Museum which, if anything, was the symbol of, you know, the most vicious imperialism in the world, the place where all the treasures of empire were gathered, you know, the rape of the colonies was all poured in there, and so on and so forth. But I think Karl Marx was quite right in studying in the British Museum. He was right in using the resources and, in fact, the liberal values of the civilization that he was trying to overcome against it. And I think the same applies in this case. But aren't you afraid that your presence at MIT gives them a clean conscience? I don't see how, really. I mean, I think my presence at MIT serves marginally to, I hope a lot, I don't know how much, to increase student activism against a lot of the things that MIT stands for, for example. Um, oh. Ladies and gentlemen, I think this has to be the end of the debate. No, it doesn't have to. They cut it all out. It could have, it could have gone for much longer, apparently. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah. It does go on for a while. They have a little bit of a back and forth there, still.
But uh, that sucks here. Hang on, let me let me stop sharing that. Mm. So that sucks. That that sucks. That sucks a lot. So we didn't really see the debate between Chomsky and Foucault because it was edited by randos we don't know, cutting out things for reasons we we don't understand. Um, so I guess I guess a, a, I guess one of the benefits of this is we we highlighted that the debate isn't representative. I guess that's a slim contribution to human knowledge, but that's disappointing. I was I was really I was really looking for. I mean, I, we we have it at least in text form. It's it's frustrating that they cut it all out from the thing. So I would have liked to actually like see them and their body language and the responses because that tells you more that we don't really get from the text. And they clearly videotaped the whole thing, so I don't know why on earth they would ever think to cut, like, massive chunks of it and to just not publish it. We'll have to, if, if anyone in the audience, like, can hunt for that down, that would be great. I would love to see the actual thing. But, uh, yeah. Anyways, we're at the uh, four-hour mark. Brooks, thank you for your help tonight. Oh, no, always happy to. It's, uh, it's uh, Foucault's in my orbit. It's a, it's, a, it's a good one. I'm not a, generally a huge fan of a lot of his stuff, but he's also his got, stuff's amazing. He's also got a good uh, stage presence. Like you're, you're, oh, no, you're, he's, he's, he's charism charismatic for sure. A Jurgen Habermas debate would be rough. Um, and just uh, chat's asking, because it was Chomsky's point, um, Marx did, I would, if I had to say the lion's share, or maybe I could even say all of his research for Das Kapital at the British Museum. Well, yeah, because he's been exiled. So, short of... Short of like the British Museum not being there, no Das Kapital coming along, I don't think would be crazy to say. There, there were very few resources that existed in the world that had books and writings on political capital that had writings on economics at the level that the British Museum did. Flat right. So, yeah. It's a, yeah. All right. Well, have a good night, Brooks. Thank you very much. I'm going to figure okay. out where I'm sure. sending everybody. I'm going to hang up on you, and then I'll send everybody away. Take care. Thank you. Appreciate it again. Oh, yeah.